Well, we welcome in everyone here from the Hawkeye of the Storm and Iowa football at the voice of college football. You are watching Iowa Post Game with Coach Don Patterson. And yes, it's the final Iowa Post Game with Coach Don Patterson of the season. Don, always bittersweet to be with you here after a bowl game, which means we have to wait another, uh, uh, what, uh, eight months before we get uh, real college football, real Hawkeye football back, although we've got some playoff games that I know have piqued your excitement. But first of all, Thank you for uh, being part of the show and uh, the Hawkeyes getting it done today. Unbelievable defensive effort, uh, as always, from Phil Parker's crew. Some bright spots on offense. Let's start, though, with the defense, uh, Don, with the shutout. How hard is it, first of all, to shut out anybody, uh, especially in a bowl game? It's difficult, Corey, uh, because obviously the, the game is set up so that teams have uh, ample opportunity to score points. And even if they don't do a great job of, of driving the length of the field, uh, the nature of the game is that typically your offense puts the defense in a bad spot somewhere over the course of the game. That didn't happen either. Uh, you know, Kentucky never enjoyed good field position. I know for sure that four possessions started inside the minus 10, maybe more than that. There were at least four. <clears throat> so our defense um, – uh, eliminated big plays. I don't know if they had anything beyond 19 yards. I don't know if they ever had an explosive. I remember there was one play for 19. <clears throat> and um, and on top of that, uh, did a great job, of course, of, of taking the ball away and, and converting it into points. Waiting for the official box. I'm sure it's up on the website, but uh, the media, uh, I was uh, – athletics uh, media personnel should be sending out the box score here. We'll be able to go through the official stats. I can tell you this uh, based on uh, an unofficial box score. Joey Labus went 14 to 24, 139 yards and a touchdown. He was obviously kind of the storyline going into this game. Of course, the Hawkeyes without Spencer Peters and Alex Padilla, each for different reasons. Uh, I, I thought Joe was okay at times, made a couple nice throws and obviously uh, overthrew Lachey a couple of times. It was a pretty conservative game plan, which, very. I understand when you're ahead. I had a couple of people go after me on Twitter, Don, because I was somewhat critical of play calling at times in this game and uh, people attacking me because, well, they're up. What do you expect them to do? Well, <laughs> you know. Well, the irony there is we threw more passes in the last two minutes of the game than we did any other part of the game. Well, you're right. And, and Don, obviously winning this game is, is foremost. I get that. But at the same time, you even said during our preview show, use this game like the first game of 2023. See what you have. And I don't know how playing a running a uber conservative game plan, even while ahead, gets you any more prepared for 2023. Right. Uh, so we can talk about that. But what's your, what were your overall takeaways from uh, Joey Labus? Well, let me say this. The main difference in the game is that we refuse to give our quarterback too much rope to hang himself. On the other hand, Kentucky was happy to to uh, to make that mistake of giving their quarterback too much rope, and sure as hell he did hang himself. Uh, our defense was um, was super, specifically about Joey. Didn't give him much to do, as you mentioned. Um, naked, naked, naked. Too many nakeds to count. Why? Why middle screen off play action, which is a wonderful <clears throat> concept. But even that can get worn out at times. I think the last of the Y screens was no good. It was um, for little or no gain. It was a catch by Laporta um, sometime in the second half. I can't recall. Uh, and they, they started playing the naked as well, too. So that got us uh, a few first downs at least and a few big plays. Let's face it, if you want to pick one offensive play of the game, uh, well, let's pick them back-to-back. -back. You'd pick uh, a Y middle screen 
to Laporta, uh, not so much for the legitimate yardage on the screen pass, but for the yards after contact. Sam did a great job of breaking tackles on that play. And then one play later, we threw a simple stop route to Lachey, and the corner can't get him on the ground, and that turns into a 15-yard touchdown. So those were our uh, two big plays on our touchdown drive. And then, of course, it's inexcusable. Um, they took a couple of shots early in the game, you might recall. I think early in the second quarter, they thrown the ball deep twice. Thought it incomplete, but at least they were trying to make a big play. They made the mistake, though, of throwing an intermediate pass. And, of course, it was overthrown. And and all Xavier had to do is field the ball and run to the end zone. A terrible, terrible throw. I mean, yeah. It's just a terrible throw, Don. You know, you don't overthrow balls over the middle of the field. You don't do that. And then, worse yet, was throwing unbelievably late to the flat. And, of course, that was a, an easy pick six for, for Cooper. Um, that poor quarterback, he started off looking left, looking left, and then he decided to throw right in the flat. And he threw blind and not, maybe not blind, but close to blind. Yeah. And, of course, Cooper just ran underneath the throw and, and almost walked into the end zone. Uh, well, so let's, let's give credit to Cooper and Xavier for making – the plays yes. they need to make, and, and and finishing them off with with fantastic returns, which really were the difference in this being a close game in the fourth quarter and being an absolute blowout. Well, there was one player in particular that had a good shot at Xavier. That was the quarterback. Uh, he had a good angle, and he couldn't finish the play either. You know, he I think he underestimated Xavier's speed a little bit. We know that Xavier's dangerous when the ball is under his arm, and he proved it on that return. I believe it was a fifty-one yard interception return, and Cooper's was simple. Of course, Cooper's dangerous with the ball under his arm, too. He didn't even need to be dangerous on that play. He literally um, uh, jogged into the end zone because he only went about a yard deep in the end zone before he had his brakes on and, and didn't want to bother to go any further. He just went to the front of the end zone. That still counted for six. He didn't have to run to the back of the end zone even because he was so much under control when he scored. Excuse me, uh, Don. A uh, couple notes here, and then we can certainly get to – got Alex waiting on hold. Our phone line is open, folks, 515-635-1601. You can also join by means of the StreamYard link. Excuse me. A um, couple notes, though, before we get to our, our uh, listeners here, Don. Uh, and I thought Lewis Riddick, who, by the way, does a very good job. I like to see him on more calls. I think he's just a, a very skilled – uh, I mean, obviously, former player, uh, very skilled at what he does um, in commentating. But he made a point of, of complimenting Brian on that first drive. You could tell Brian made a concerted effort to mix in, it, mix in a lot of motion, a lot of play fakes. And I thought some of that misdirection kept uh, kind of kept uh, or got Kentucky off balance, um, certainly caught them off guard. And give Brian credit because – that early drive, which, you know, they got a few first downs in that first drive that was able to really uh, ensure field position early. And then of course, Iowa special teams and defense kept, uh, kept the, uh, sorry about that. I'm going to turn that down. Uh, kept field position throughout much of that first half. Just talk about the, the first drive and what, what you saw Brian Ferentz trying to accomplish by means of play calling. Well, we won and we deferred. And as I recall, on the first drive, I believe Kentucky, on their, on their first possession, they did have one first down. Put into us. We we moved the ball a little bit, I think, from one or two first downs. But every time we traded punts, of course, we picked up yardage. And that was especially noticeable when you factored in punt returns. Uh, that one punt return, I've got it written down. How long was that? Um, 34 yards, unofficially at least. I had it down for 34 that was really our first explosive play. It was the 34-yard punt return. And um, But here's this stuff that aggravates you. Um, and talking about big plays in the kicking game, the next big play in the kicking game, punt from the minus 47 down on the two. Um, so that was a 51-yard punt that was killed on the two-yard line. Uh, incidentally, on that next possession for Kentucky, a really nice – critical down open field tackle by Sebastian Castro that forced a punt. I believe they were only maybe three yards away from the first down and, and Sebastian got, I believe it was the quarterback, as I recall, got him on the ground without any problem. 
Uh, that left us finishing the first quarter scoreless. And now we can mention um, specifics about about first touchdown in a game. I'd mentioned going in, really important to score the first touchdown without giving any details. Here's the truth. In these 18 games that were played between us, nine apiece, nine for us, nine for Kentucky, uh, the score, if, the, the record if you scored the first touchdown was 15 and two, 88% win. That's why it was important to score the first touchdown. And as soon as we were up seven, nothing, I felt good. And shortly thereafter, we went up 14, nothing. Then I felt really good because I couldn't see us losing a 14 point lead on an offense that was that inept versus a very good Iowa defense, not to mention a really outstanding kicking game. So that's kind of how the game played out. It wasn't very exciting to watch, but it was certainly there's nothing wrong with a, a routine win. And we certainly had one today. All right, to our phone line caller, we're going to put you on hold. We'll get over to Alex. We'll come back to you. Alex, welcome to the show, sir. Good. How's it going, guys? It's been a long time. How you been? It's been a long time. Looks like you've been growing a beard since the last time you were on here. Is this no shave December? Uh, no, it's, you know, obviously in Iowa, it gets a little colder. So it's one of those where I, it, and it's really patchy. It's, you know, the my Irish red beard, brown hair, or lack thereof, I guess. Looks so. like you should be wearing plaid and, and uh, <laughs> dancing around. In a, I don't look good in plaid. What do they call those wearing, male dresses? Uh, uh, wearing a kilt. A kilt. kilt. Oh, huh? God, no. Oh, God. No, no, no. No, no, no. Yeah, plaid, no, not so good. Kilt, no, definitely not. But, I mean. I think today, uh, Alex. I, I mean, defense obviously played really well. And I was really excited after that first drive. Uh, Brian Ferris, I think, out called a good first series and then after that he went to very typical brian conservative run the ball two times and screen pass on the third understandingly you have a freshman quarterback first time start against a good kentucky defense you know you don't want to put the balls ball in harm's way but you had success in the first in that first series you know and then they totally went away from it which was really just mind-boggling and then um, one, on one of their third downs, they were what second and second and two halfback dive, third and one. Then they try a post route to Laporta. Well, oh, hold on a second. So let me ask you this, Don. I want to make before we move on. So okay. again, comparatively, from my perspective, and I agree with Alex. First drive, you saw Brian. He obviously had a plan on the first drive from scrimmage, which is uh, credit to him for having that plan. But then it seemed like after that first drive, and I understand, again, a lot of this game was field, field position control, and that helped them gain field position early. But it did seem like Brian and this offensive staff went away from what was working on that first drive. And it seemed like you just kind of went right back to uh, Iowa vanilla brand uh, conservatism as it relates to the offensive play calling. What changed and why do you think it changed from drive one through the rest of the game? Well, I think as soon as we went up 14 nothing, then for sure we went into uh, uh, uber-conservative mode. We weren't going to take any chances at that point. I certainly understand that because unless we gave them some help, they weren't going to be able to beat us. <clears throat> Our defense was just simply too good, and they were too inept on offense to really challenge our defense very well. Um, you know, the, the way the game started, just to set the record straight, our first two plays were both nakeds. They were both naked at one. They fake left, roll right. Two different faking backs. One, I think, was a fly sweep, as I recall. I can't remember for sure. <clears throat> but we ran naked twice for for a modest yardage. The third play was the mixed, misdirection Y screen in the middle, uh, middle screen. Um, and then on fourth and two, that followed. Fourth and two, you remember what happened there? We passed up a 50-yard field goal attempt. Yeah. We, it was a fifty-one. Uh, it was a fifty-one. It was a fifty-one-yard field goal attempt. Well, right. I don't, I'm not sure of that simply because we were on. Let me get my yard 30, line straight. We were, we're on the thirty. We're on the thirty-two and a half. Thirty-four, Don. Uh, I don't okay. think so. Okay. Well, I've got it written down. I can tell you in about two seconds. Uh, okay. I, let's split the difference. I, I see thirty-three according to the yeah. box score. Thirty-three. So, Trust yeah. me, if you go back and look, it's the if you go back and look at the 32 and a half, because I thought about, do I call it a 50 or a 51? As you know, nowadays they spot the ball deeper than seven and a half, maybe as deep as eight. 
So it would have either been 50 or 51. And now, I agree. What I think kicked, the, kicked the field goal in a game that we expected points to be hard to come by. Yeah. Kick a field goal there. Yeah. Uh, now, what I didn't know, and, and I'm still not sure, um, it didn't appear that the wind was much of a factor in either direction. So I did wonder about the wind. I thought, well, but that doesn't make sense because if we deferred and they took the ball, logically you would think we would take the wind. We would if that's the, the case, we had the wind at our back even. Yeah. So I don't know why they didn't uh, take the field goal attempt. We threw incomplete on, on Y flat. We ran a flat route to, to Sam and threw high, as I recall. Um, and that left us with um, uh, a lost opportunity in terms of hitting a field goal or pooch punting if we wanted to go that route. I guess well, we weren't going to do that. Just, just for the record, uh, but going back to Alex's point here, you, you said once we, we hit 14 points, we went uber conservative. Well, just for the record, they, they had the seven-play, 45-yard drive, which resulted in a turnover on downs. Then their next two uh, next two possessions were three yards and out, or th- three plays and out, three plays and out. Then came the touchdown. So uh, I, I felt yeah. like they went conservative before they even got on the board, Don. I thought it was 0-0, and they went kind of conservative. You know, I don't know what happened on those next two possessions other than I do recall we tried to – we came out throwing the ball in the first possession, more or less, right? And then second and third possessions, I think we made a little more of an attempt to run the ball. Very, very modest success. A couple of yards here, a couple of yards there. And of course, Kentucky's a good, solid run defense. And um, as you mentioned, we couldn't, couldn't generate any traction there. And then finally, we had a little bit of a shorter field. It was we were on the plus forty two, I guess, because I believe it was a two play drive, wasn't it? The touchdown drive. I believe that was a first yeah, down to Laporta. It was the, the screen pass to Laporta, then the uh, the pass to Lachey. Two plays forty two right. yards for a touchdown. Two plays forty two, and of course the middle screen was thrown about. Well, theoretically, it's thrown behind the line, right? Uh, Sam caught it on or near the line of scrimmage. It, it, was, a, we, it was about a three yard pass, and he made. I think I counted seven or eight missed tackles. But you can't he, catch the ball downfield because we have linemen downfield. Hmm. Right? So it, was, it was behind the line of scrimmage is what you're saying. It was thrown on or near the line. They'll give you a little bit of latitude. I think we caught it right on the line of scrimmage. One time I thought I was a little fearful that I think it was 77. Is that Colby? Uh, they could have flagged him maybe from being downfield. He was just a couple of yards downfield. No flag. They stood. Uh, but anyway, 42-yard drive. Just on the strength of yak yardage by the two tight ends, really. Uh, the middle screen would have been worth just a little bit, except for Sam's run. And then, of course, the stop route would have been, if, if they could have tackled us, uh, Lachey would have gained five yards with the stop route rather than 15. Uh, the corner turned him down, you might say. Uh, didn't really make much of an effort to tackle him. A size mismatch, of course, but but shame on that corner for not making a bold effort to, to get Lachey on the ground. Uh, so seven nothing seemed huge though I'll say that uh, it was zero zero at the end of one quarter. Incidentally, the number two parameter in terms of reliability and identifying the winner was first quarter scoring. Well, we we were zero zero of course at the end of the quarter, so that was out the window. That one incidentally over the all eighteen games was thirteen and two, eighty seven percent win if you have the lead after one. Um, so. Um, and I see what Bob says. You were, you were right, Coach. We won two out of three and one. Defense and special teams clearly won. Uh, you might argue – it's kind of hard to argue that our offense outplayed their defense. I don't know if – did we gain 200 yards in the game? Uh, if we did, we barely did. 200 yards. We're, 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 we're wondering if we we gained 200 yards for the game, Don. Uh, yeah. No. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, let's say did. 206. 206. 206. Okay. Uh, but in our defense, let's face it, a couple of times we didn't get to get on the field. After the pick sixes, of course, that meant that meant that we had to watch our defense play the next series of downs also, right, because we had to kick off after we scored the points. Alex, uh, i got a couple of callers, but you, you, you got, I'll give you the floor here. All right. Now, the last couple of things, I mean, the one I – kind of the big question, again, I had, I mean – it was when uh, at the end of the half, Iowa calls their last time out to get the ball back. They get up uh, uh, off sides, get five extra yards, and they run a halfback dive. It's like, take a shot. You know, I was really confused by, let's call our last time out so we have some time to get the ball back and we run a halfback, you know, dive. Why, you know, what's the 
what's the point of wasting that time out and potentially muffing the punt, you know, giving Kentucky a good, great field position to get points on the board. Um, you know, and I, and I'll just make this comment cause I've seen some, uh, some comments pop up as you guys were, as you guys were uh, talking about the, um, some of the offensive plays is that, you know, it just, it's, they say, you know, we're never happy with, you know, it's an, I wouldn't be happy, everything like I'm happy that I won, but you kind of said like, this is, think of this as a game of like 2023, your first game of 2023, see what you have. And it's kind of more of the exact same. I think just Iowa fans, myself included, Corey, you know, someone said you're being too critical. I don't know who said it, but uh, it's just like, well, we've seen this all year. And from what we're hearing, there's going to be no change as it stands right now. There's going to be no, absolutely no change. And it's so frustrating as Iowa fans, it doesn't matter who we get in. You know, we have Cade and we have Eric all coming in from both Michigan. I, I know we have a couple of wide receivers um, coming in from recruiting, but at the same time, we're just like, okay, we're sticking with the kind of the, the main problem we've had all season, which was, which is Brian Ferentz and Kirk Ferentz and Bri- and Gary Barters, you know, it, it, the lack of response from them to do anything is just, it's really disheartening as Iowa fans, because I want to be excited about this team next year. But as, as it stands right now, I'm happy that, we won. I think this defense and special teams again will be great next year, but it's the offense. What's, what's this offense going to look like? And I don't trust Brian. I don't trust Kirk to make radical changes. Now I know Devonte Vines had commented or Twitter put out on his Twitter post that he said that they're cha- you know, he's confident changes will be made, but what does that mean? You know, what, what changes does that mean? So, Outside of you know getting a new offensive coordinator, I don't see this offense being this offense being as you know I don't think they'll be as bad as they were this year, but I don't see much improvement. Well, I appreciate this comment from Metallicus. Uh, this is uh, I, I appreciated this as well. Matt Berry and Lewis Riddick, who I, I thought both did a, a pretty good job in this broadcast. Beginning of the game, they were really like they were co- they were very complimentary of Kentucky's quarterback, and they were like basically saying that like you know. They, this quarterback is going to make this defense really scared and everything like that until Iowa got a couple pick sixes and they kind of changed their tune. Like well, it was, it was pretty much in that first quarter. After that, they they were pretty, like um, they. I feel like they called an even game after that first quarter when they were really hyping up that quarterback because he was he's a mobile quarterback and he's like, oh, he's going to make defenses, you know, scared and everything like that. And it's like like Iowa isn't a top defense or we haven't seen this type of quarterback before, but. At the end of the game, they made a point of saying, uh, talking about how <laughs> Iowa could have been with an offense, and that's a fair point. So you can question, the, or, or you can question the, the offense next year, and that's fair. Uh, I question the offense this past year in the sense of th- this was a, a historically good defense, and there's nothing wrong with looking back and saying, yeah, you ended up eight and five, but you ended up eight and five with an absolutely phenomenal defense and an absolutely phenomenal special teams unit. That should be unacceptable. From, from a standpoint of we're, we're, our goal is to be great as a football program, that's where my criticism comes in. Yes, I'm with you. You're happy with a win, Don, but but you're not satisfied. And if we're satisfied, if the coaches are satisfied, the players are satisfied, then uh, they shouldn't be here because, because satis- being satisfied with being 8-5 and five should not be good enough. And, I mean, let's be honest. This defense and special teams unit is championship quality. If you had some semblance of an offense, you're probably looking at, uh, you know, at least 10 wins. At least, well, 10 wins. it's not hard to imagine 11 and two, right? Because only two teams beat us convincingly. Yeah, just two. Michigan and Ohio State. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you can maybe count Nebraska in that, but That's but true. even then, we, even, about- with the, even with the better offense, we we probably made that game a little more interesting if not maybe tied it. Yeah. Well, the mystery uh, is it relates to Nebraska, of course, is if they had a vulnerability, it was their run defense. And yet we didn't try to run the ball, really. We when we did, when we did the run the ball, when we did run the ball, we would get chunk yards, and then we went right away from it, which was, you know, right. I watched the game was really puzzling. But you know, that's over a month ago, so you know. Alex, so I appreciate your calls as always. We're gonna have a, a just kind of give everybody a preview. We're gonna be doing a wrap up show here in a couple of weeks with Coach Patterson. So this is not the final show of the year; it is a final post game show. But uh, hope to hear from you then, and uh, appreciate you being a part of the show all season. Yep, and hey, guys, have a. I hope you guys had a wonderful holiday and have a happy new year. Uh, hope, uh, hopefully, you guys have it. That wrap up show sometime uh, weekend. I work nights during the week, so. Um, but I uh, hope I'll tune in for them. But uh, again, have a happy new year to everybody. To you both, Don and 
Uh, Corey, I really appreciate you guys coming on, letting us fans come on here and kind of speak our mind, get things off our chest, vent, you know, celebrate whatever the case is. Um, I think it's really great that you allow us to do that. Um, and then everyone on here who's commenting, please, again, like the video. I think Corey and Don do a great job. I personally don't follow the basketball, but um, – go on there and watch uh, with, uh, I believe, Gary Close is when you do the post games with him. So yep. um, the last thing I'll say for the final year, uh, have a happy new year. Go Hawks. Thank you, sir. You do the same, Alex. Yeah, but for the record, uh, I don't care what anybody says and everybody has a right to their opinion. Uh, the, the tandem here from the Hawkeye of the Storm with you and Coach Close is the best, Don. Like, the, there is no better well, tandem for Hawkeye athletics than, than having Don Patterson and Gary Close – on after every <laughs> major Iowa athletic event. So thank you. And thanks to Gary close. Cause you guys are, are phenomenal. Um, thank you, Corey. Let's uh, let's get to our caller. Who's been waiting patiently on hold. Thank you for calling Iowa post game with coach Don Patterson. Who's on the line. Hey, it's Alan from North Carolina. Uh, really love the contact Corey and um, Don love your insight throughout the year. So thank you very thank much. You, sir. A uh, couple of comments on today's game. Uh, first of all, on defense, um, when I watch Wampa and when I watch Graves, they look like next level players. Uh, I know that this was the first opportunity we really saw Wampa show his stuff. He looks like a guy in two years that has a chance to be a first rounder on the next level. He's just so athletic. Uh, it was great to see him show his stuff uh, today. And I think he's going to be a fantastic player. And I'm curious to see if Graves builds up uh, his mass to be more of an inside guy, or is he more of an outside guy? Um, another comment on defense uh, as uh, in regards to Jack Campbell, going to the next level, what type of player do you see him being on the next level? Is he a tweener? Is he more of a Josie Jewell? Is he a guy that can play all three downs? Uh, just your insight on that before I have a comment on their offense. Well, first of all, I'll just give my thought and then I'll turn it over to you, Don. The, the Aaron Graves comment is, I think you're right on. And I, Don, there's nobody higher on Aaron Graves out of high school than me. I, I just thought that kid was going to be, still think he's going to be elite. And absolutely. I mean, Xavier Wampa was a five-star for a reason. Uh, I thought Aaron Graves certainly was under-recruited primarily because he committed to Iowa so early. But that kid was a national phenom. Uh, I, I'm starting to think maybe he ends up inside, Don, because he's a big I see big, him more as an inside player. He's just going to be a big kid. He's already a big kid. Uh, yeah. I think he's he's um, he's a better matchup to be inside than outside. I mean, you you like the idea of him playing outside because of his pass rushing uh, skills, but well, but I, I like him as a three technique. You know, typically if you're in four down football, one of those defensive tackles is going to be a three technique. He's going to be outside shade of the guard, and fundamentally, the way protection would typically work, he's going to be one on one against the guard. I like Graves working in, against the guard and having a two-way go versus that guard uh, and not having the center there to help. Um, so I see him as really being able to overpower all kinds of offensive guards in this league. Not that he couldn't overpower an offensive tackle too, uh, but they, the advantage of playing inside, of course, is some more direct line to the quarterback. You know, you're typically you're rushing uh, on more of a direct line to get up in his face and to cause him problems. And then what was your, your second uh, comment, caller? Um, when I look at a Jack Campbell, I try to envision what type of player he's on the next level. I'm a huge Jet fan, and I love his game. But to me, he seems too big to play inside. I mean, I think he's 6'5", six, he's six, 250, and I worry on the next level that he might be too big and may not be fast enough to be a three down lineman. What do you guys think before I ask a question on the special team and on the quarterback position? You've heard me say before, Corey, he reminds me of Erlacher. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. that's a, that's a good analysis. And I know Erlacher wasn't that big coming out of college, but he played linebacker at probably 245, 250. I think I don't recall exactly what he weighed as, as a Chicago player, uh, but he certainly was one of the best at the time, and he had that same kind of long frame that that our guy has. Um, so I, I see Jack as being a really, really solid inside backer along the lines of an Earl Laker. Um, they like him tall if they can find him because, let's face it, um, 
any number of passes. Jack's been able to get his fingertips on any number of balls that were meant to be thrown over the linebacker. So that gives him a little more value than a shorter linebacker, such as Josie. Josie's got a great nose for the ball. Uh, but I like the idea of a, a fence post linebacker being taller, more like Jack. It's a little more difficult to get the ball over him. I love watching his game, and I, I can't wait to watch him on the next level. Two other comments, one positive, one negative. I know, Corey, you had mentioned that you think Tory may come back, but watching the way he punted today and now that NFL scouts can watch him on this level, I, I can't see him coming back. This guy has a chance to be the top punter on the next level. The way that he, he kicked today was it was just outstanding. I, I feel like he's ready to play on the next level. And the comment on the quarterback, um, what frustrated me, and especially after that first drive, is I'm thinking to myself, Cade McNamara is watching this game and watching the way that Brian's calling this game. He must think to himself, he must know something because the way they called that game after that first drive would have frustrated any quarterback. And I know that Cade got a nice chunk of change to come here, but there must be something behind the scenes to to think that maybe this was Brian's final game as an offensive coordinator, because if I'm Cade and I'm watching the way he called that game, I I know it's a first year quarterback, a guy who had never played on this level, but some of the calls and some of the schemes after that first drive would drive any quarterback nuts. What do you think? And uh, Don, do you think that this might've been, uh, Brian's final game is all OC because if I'm Cade, I'm watching that. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Um, you want to go first, Corey? Yeah, I mean, I can go first. Um, I, 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 I'll sum it up with this. I, I don't know if you're right or wrong. I did hear Brian Ferentz, and I'm. By the way, we're going to play a clip from Brian here in a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, we, we've been. We're excited about the win, but I do want to play a clip that kind of disturbed me from yesterday's press conference. But Brian was asked specifically about promises that may or may not have been made toward Eric All, but I think specifically Cade McNamara, and he answered, quite frankly, no. There have been no promises made to those guys. Um, so some somebody's not telling the truth. <laughs> That's just all there is to it. I'm not calling Brian a liar, but you know when Cade McNamara says that they've assured me they're going to open it up, <laughs> like that that you know that's sort of counteracting what uh, what Brian said yesterday. So somebody's not telling the truth there. Whether that's because Brian's moving on or not, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I've told you, and I, I've told you, Don, every indication that I've gotten from people who I believe to be reliable sources, they're not telling me, yes, I think this is going to happen or no, this isn't going to happen. But kind of reading between the lines, I have gotten no indication from those individuals that there's going to be a change. Now, maybe there will be. Maybe maybe Kirk's keeping this on the down low, and certainly to save face, Brian may have find another job and, and have that lined up, and he doesn't, he doesn't want to appear like this has been planned for a few weeks. I don't know the answer to that question, but, Don, can you answer our caller's question? Do you believe this was Brian Ferentz's final game as Iowa's OC? Uh, no, I do not. I don't think so. I'll tell you one reason I say that. You might recall a comment that Kirk made a while back in time after the regular season ended, he mentioned that we're going to go back after the season and look at all aspects of our, of our program. And then he went on to say, I don't think anything's broken. You remember that phrase? I don't think anything's broken. <laughs> Sorry. You yeah. Know? I got to compose myself. Yes, I did. I, yes. Yeah. My, my thought when I heard that was if we're ranked 130 out of 131 in total offense, then the offense is broken. It is broken, and that was the impression I had at the time. Uh, so um, I don't know what Cade knows. It's kind of hard for me to believe that Cade would commit to come here without some assurance that the offense was going to be uh, more uh, more aggressive with play calling than what this one's been this year. And that's what I'm thinking because if you're Cade and you're watching this and – there has to be something behind the scenes. If there isn't, then that's an indictment on the AD. I mean, I know that you've been very critical, critical of Barta, um, Corey. And, and if you're watching this today, you have to just take him to task because this offense going forward, the way they called game, the game after the first 
series and the way their offense performed the whole season and Brian Ferentz keeps his job after this, I mean, then this team and this uh, program is accepting mediocrity because this defense had to carry them the entire year. They carried them today. Their special teams was fantastic. But their offense, if they allow Brian Ferentz to call another play going into 2023, then Gary Barta has to be taken to, to task on this because this is an embarrassment. Unless unless McNamara just got a boatload of money and just wanted to cash in, which I agree with Don, I can't see him being a guy who just comes here strictly for the money. But the idea that he's going to come here and no changes will be made, it's just it's just a knock on the on the AD, and it's basically the AD just um, listening to the coach and not doing anything to uh, to make changes, and that's well, a really troubling sign. Yeah, let me just let me just say one thing, and then you know we can move on. And I, I know, listen, I, I appreciate your questions, and I know we're we're gonna get ripped. I'm gonna get destroyed in the chat by the apologists and the people who say, "Well, you, why you know you're 30 minutes in and you're already complaining." I, you brought it up for the record. You brought it up, caller. So I did. I brought I, it up. I'm yeah. gonna take. I'll take. But I'll take the shot. I, I will say this comment that was made yesterday by Brian. Um, he he was quoted as saying, and I heard him say it. He said, "I would say I did the best I could this year with the pieces we had to try to put this team in a position to succeed." So the problem with that, that statement. That's a joke. Well, the problem with that statement. There's a couple of problems. First of all, my initial reaction to, well, the best you got isn't good enough. <laughs> I mean, it's very simple. The best you got isn't good enough. So that means we need to change. Second thing I'll say, when you're ensuing or implying that personnel was not good enough for you to be as successful as you wanted to be, whose fault is that? This, is, this isn't the NFL. This is college football. You are responsible for recruiting. You are responsible for developing. And if you're failing on any of those fronts, it, it, the buck stops with you. So I don't want to hear this stuff about how you didn't have good enough personnel and you didn't have the pieces good enough to be to be successful. Whose fault is that? I mean, whose fault is it that you lost Charlie Jones? Whose fault is it that you're losing Arlen Bruce, Keegan Johnson? I, I just I, I thought that was a I was disturbed by a couple comments made yesterday by Brian. And that that comment bothered me because, you know, you're it's almost like you're ripping the kids in a, in a am I reading that wrong, Don? When you say we didn't have the pieces or I did the best. The suggestion was we didn't have good enough personnel. Yeah, so you're you're kind of ripping the kids that you recruited and failed in developing. That's how I look at it. Uh, Caller, right. is, you read that? You, did you read that differently? Uh, absolutely, you are a hundred percent right. And to me, I mean, it's a shot against the AD. The AD to me is petrified of losing his job because he's trying to uh, appease the coach. That's that's what I get out of it. Uh, if any other AD in a top program would see what's going on and would tell the coach either he goes or you go. And I think that the AD is petrified on losing his job or he just doesn't want to make changes. That's a major problem going forward. And that's why I think in the back of my mind, and I agree with Don on this, there is no way Cade McNamara came here strictly for the money. I, I just can't see it. It makes no sense. He was a top signal caller in the portal and he would come to Iowa and come to Iowa strictly for a buck rather than come here for the money and the ability to make changes. And if he, and he just came here strictly for the buck, that's a knock against him. If he came here and there's no changes made, that's a knock against the AD. And I think it's a real troubling sign going forward for this program. And I appreciate everything that you guys have done throughout the season Continue good luck and happy new year to all you guys. I love the contact, especially here down in North Carolina, where I have to listen to ACC football all year long. So I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for everything. Thank you for the call, Ryan. Appreciate you listening. Hey, great call. Uh, and uh, he's not alone. We've got plenty of Hawkeye fans down there in uh, the Carolinas, including uh, well, Drew Stevens. Uh, he's from that area. And, uh, I, I know. Look, I, I uh, the whole situation with with Brian is is troubling, uh, Don. Because uh, at least this is my opinion on the on the situation. Uh, I, I just I, I don't know how you defend bringing a guy back who, who's put up the 
results that he has these last two years. I mean, these have been historically bad offenses these last two years. I, I, I just, I, I'm very, fr- very frustrated by it. And I'm past the point of waiting and seeing. And, and if I get ripped and lose viewers because I'm being staunch on my feelings, even after a win, I don't care. Is that, and I, I know you, you're limited with what, what you can say, Don, and I respect that. But uh, I, I agree with you. I, I Do I think he's gone? Probably not. Uh, but I'm disappointed in Kirk Ferentz if that move isn't made. And I'm very disappointed in Gary Barta as the AD who's supposed to be Brian's boss. And, you know, Gary was quoted yesterday as saying that he, you know, he's going to be more involved than he normally would, but he will still defer to Kirk. <laughs> How can you say that when you're supposed to be legally, you're supposed to be Brian's supervisor. It's not supposed to be Kirk. Not to mention you're in charge of the entire athletic department. Yeah, I, I, I get, I just, you know, that, that bothers me. And, and do I believe that Gary's going to put Kirk over his leg if Kirk makes the wrong decision? No, I don't. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a top down problem. Uh, so, anyways, we can get off this subject. We, we've got callers who are waiting. And if, if other callers want to bring it up, they can. But uh, let's get to OS for Hawks, who's been on hold for quite some time. OS for Hawks, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great. It's good to see you and, and Don. Um, Before I forget, Happy New Year, and I hope you had a wonderful holiday season. I want to talk about the offensive line. Okay. Good good conversation. Absolutely. You you just mentioned it, our offense in the last two seasons, and I am a long-time Hawkeye follower. Long, long time. Uh, And I'm a former offensive lineman myself in the day. I'm old. I'm older like Don than I am Corey. I'm <laughs> anyway, I see the offensive line this year. The play has been poor across the board and I'm not knocking the kids because I'm sure that they, they play their hearts out. I love my Hawkeyes, but we have had an offensive line problem. And until we fix an offensive line problem, we are going to have offensive woes. And I think Don would agree. I mean, The foundation of your offense is your offensive line. You have to protect the quarterback and you have to be able to run block so that you can score points. And I watched the offensive line today again. I I don't remember what was the third or fourth down play, um, 52 for Kentucky. On a fourth down play, didn't get blocked and tackle somebody in the backfield. How does that happen on an offensive line? Uh, uh, that's my point. Um, another play I saw, um, 77, is that um, Colby. Plum or Colby? Colby. Colby. On, on, on a um, – uh, I, can't, I can't think of the name, sorry. Um, he pulls. Defensive lineman goes around the backside of him and still makes the tackle. He never touched anybody. On, on, not a crackback block, but on a, on a, anyway, I guess what I'm saying is that I, I see the biggest part of our offensive woes being on the offensive line. And um, I think that's got to be a major point of emphasis going forward. Uh, I love that we won today. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up, Corey, is what you said earlier about how good we were on special teams and defense. And my question is, is why isn't the offense seem to be held to the same standard? That's my biggest question. And I will just, that's all I have to say. Well, it's not really, not to interrupt you, it's really not, I mean, not to sound facetious, it's really not a question, right? I mean, you know the answer to that question, right? You're just kind of, you're offering a rhetorical, correct? Well, it hasn't been, yes. I mean, and the answer to that question is is who the offensive coordinator is and his relationship to Kirk. That's the sad thing about this. We all know that's the answer. Everyone knows that's the answer. That's what makes it so ridiculous. <laughs> that's the answer. You you answer. Yeah. I mean, you, you can answer it in the question. Why isn't Brian Ferentz held to the same standard as Phil? Well, he's Brian Ferentz. I mean, not ripping him. That's just the reality of it. Yep. Good point. Uh, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else to say other than that. That's yeah. You know, that, you know, these, but, and I see some of the people in the chat, and I respect everybody's opinions on here, but these people who say, well, you know, points don't, uh, points are what matter, yards don't matter. Well, that's true ultimately. 
But guess what? In the five losses this year, they didn't score enough points. All right. They lost a game nine to six. All right. Uh, they they won a game seven to three in which the defense outscored the offense against an FCS team. They lost a game 10 to seven to Iowa State. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's yeah. not going with the whole points are all that matters. I mean, we, we can go over all the metrics, red zone efficiency. How about critical down efficiency, Don? How about in this game, uh, Iowa, for the game, O for 13 on third and fourth down? I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> we, I, yeah. I, and Kentucky was really bad, too. Give credit to Iowa's defense. But this is this is the type of thing we see week in and week out from Iowa's offense, not just against the best defenses. Um, and, and there were games, I give Brian credit. I thought he called a really good game against Purdue. They 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 played well against Northwestern, um, so it's it's not like he's incapable of calling a good game or, or having a, a drive like in the first drive of this game where I thought he called a pretty good series of plays. But um, there, there's this is like I feel like I'm having this deja vu. We're having the same conversation we had a year ago. Multiple problems require multiple solutions, and they've made to me uh, they have they have addressed one of the problems, and that's the quarterback position. But the quarterback position, unfortunately, is not the biggest problem. It may be the biggest problem personnel-wise, but offensive line, OS for Hawks, as you said, offensive line still a problem. Um, they have not addressed that as of yet in the portal. Uh, and certainly wide receivers a problem. But I think uh, a coaching right now is, is the biggest issue because this is a pattern. And I, you know, I don't know what else to say other than that. Don, do you have any insight on the situation here? What, what about critical downs? I lost you for a minute, Corey. Are you with us, Don? Yeah, I'm, you're back now. Yeah, you have any insight on this? Uh, critical downs? Or well, here's, one, here's one thing you've asked me in the in the past, Corey. Uh, what can we do to have a more efficient offense, a more productive offense? And one of the things I've said, and it hadn't changed, if we have more variety within our within our our plays. That gives you that makes you more difficult to defend, and I found myself saying today, well, if you can defend naked, and if you can defend wide middle screen, then there's really not much for you to worry about because we're not really capable of doing anything else. Uh, and those plays hit for us, but you know we 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 kind of wore them out as the game played on. They defended them better over time. We just need more diversity in our in our play selection than what we have. We don't have enough. We don't have enough plays. I mean, that's honestly. Um, and people might say, well, how can we not have enough place? You got to understand, smart linebackers, they first off notice personnel. Every time the bench signals to them what the personnel is on the field, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't even have to figure it out themselves. They look to the bench, there's a guy over there off a the sign that says 11, 10, 21, whatever the case might be. They know personnel. It takes them not very long at all to identify a formation or a backfield set. And at that point, they've really been able to zero in a lot on what plays are coming. Uh, and I know you've, you've quoted some players from other teams that said that helped us a lot. We had a great idea of what was coming. Uh, that's the truth. You know, we can be better on offense if we have more diversity within our play selection, have more plays that can run, that can do more things. And um, today's a good example. You know, why middle screen is a good play for us. Uh, and I'm glad we had it in because it's a very deceptive play. But even we, we even wore that one out. The last time we ran it, it was a gain of one, maybe. Uh, and, of course, nakeds are obvious. And one thing we don't hardly do is run naked to the left. But if you're if we're faking to the offense's left, you better be prepared for naked because we like to roll right on naked and throw the ball, uh, typically to Sam uh, or maybe Lachey. And, um, and that's been a good, solid play for us. But – the problem with naked is before too long, they're coming up the field and they're not really, they're not really worried about chasing a play down from behind. that's going away from them. They're just focused on pulling up the quarterback. And as the game went on today, you saw people up in our face more on nakeds and we had to throw the ball in a hurry to get rid of it. And sometimes we connected, sometimes we didn't. Uh, but the bottom line is you need to do more things than just a few, because if you're only doing a few things, the defense can focus on taking those few things away. That's about as honest as I can be. Anything else, caller? I just, just one last thing. I I did want to say on a positive. I thought that uh, Labus played very well today for his first start. Um, didn't turn the ball over. I I think he did uh, more than an adequate job at 
at quarterback. And like I said, again, uh, happy new year. We'll talk Thank to you sir. later. Thank you. I thought Labus was, was okay. I mean, I wasn't blown away, Garrett, uh, Don, but you know, they didn't really you? utilize, they didn't utilize his feet nearly as much as I wish they had. That'd be my only, my, my biggest right. criticism. I, I wish we could have seen him, you know, it sounded like throughout bowl practice that, uh, he struggled, uh, through the air and, and he struggled for the most part through the air. I mean, it, the, the completions he made in the yardage, uh, a lot of his yardage came on that one drive, most of which was off a of Sam Laporta dump down, uh, in which Sam, did, like you said, the yak yards were significant. Uh, right. I laughed at myself. You might remember this. Uh, there was a, uh, a sequence in there where we took it. We ended up with a delay penalty should not have happened. We had, a, we broke the huddle way early and labor simply didn't, didn't um, pay any attention to the play clock. And so do you remember what the next call was after the delay of game? It was a cue draw. And I remember chuckling, well, they're trying to punish labor saying, okay, fine. You gave us a delay. Go ahead and run cue draw. We ran it for 10. The only problem, it was 18 yards needed at that point. So uh, that 10 yards is still kind of hollow yardage because we still end up having to punt. Let's get to our next caller. Thank you for calling Iowa post game with coach Don Patterson. Who's on the line. Hey, Corey, I am going to come and go Hawkeyes. All right. Go Hawkeyes. Sounds good. All right. Let's, uh, let's get to our next caller. The phone line is open. We've got people here on StreamYard. Let's get Ryan into the mix. Ryan, welcome to the show. Our next caller. The phone line is open. They hung up on her. She could have had Hello, Ryan. Are you here? Hello, Ryan. We can't hear you, sir. No, you are MIA, sir. Let's uh, see if he can get that problem figured out. Let's go to our next caller. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Patterson, who's on the line. Hey, Corey. It's uh, Ryan from McGregor. Hey, Ryan. Uh, I just uh, uh, want to thank uh, you guys for doing the show. Uh, I think you guys are nailing it quite thoroughly. Don, I really appreciate your comment as far as the diversity of the play calling um, I put on the chat a couple times whether or not. Um, well, let me let me add a, let me tell the story first and why I'm asking the question. All right, uh, there, there was a few years back where um, Barry Alvarez was the AD at Wisconsin and was asked to coach the Wisconsin team uh, who were playing Auburn, and I'll never forget um, Barry. Uh, was, you know, when, when they asked him to coach the, the team for Wisconsin, he said, well, you guys aren't tough enough. You know? And what he did is he instituted two-a-days and <laughs> they ended up winning like 34-31. And, and most of the Badger players credited uh, the workouts that were tremendous prior to the bowl game as the reason why they won. Um, the thing that discouraged me the most about the game today is I didn't see any improvement in the O-line. I, I really thought for sure that, you know, they would be doing two-a-days <laughs> to get ready for this bowl game. Um, and I don't know if they did or not, Don. Maybe you know um, if they did, but it didn't look like it to me. And I, I didn't see really any improvement from the Nebraska game today with regards to the offensive line play, and it was disappointing. Uh, in that respect. I mean, I'm glad Iowa got the win, but, you know, all the callers are right in talking about frustration with some really innovative plays, diversity of plays, contingency plans, as you like to call them, or I like to call them, I guess. Uh, they had that, and then all of a sudden they got away from it and went back to the business as usual of, you know, three uh, three plays and punting. Uh, so, um what do you think, Don? Did did they did they do enough bull prep to to really make themselves a better football team uh, today or not? Well, I can see where you would wonder, looking at the O line performance during the game, wonder if how much um, how beneficial those bowl workouts were for our O line that was out there playing in the game today. Uh, the part that you cannot measure is the improvement on the part of those guys that didn't play today. Let's face it, they had a chance to improve their fundamentals over the last three weeks, and I have to believe that was accomplished. Um, and that's true, not just for O-line, but all positions, most sides of the ball. 
So I got to believe that the, the bowl workouts have helped with our development of players, especially that you don't see much during the game. And um, maybe you're disappointed more for the performance you saw today in comparison to the performance you saw against uh, Nebraska. Did we make progress or not? I can see where you're not sure that we made any progress. That would be logical that you might think that way. Brian? Yeah, I hear you, Corey, but I didn't hear Don's final part. But uh, I, I got the, ju the gist of his message, and that, that that's fine. I I didn't know um, precisely, you know, like if, if, if the lineup that Iowa had today was, was completely – knew how many young guys. I, I was a little disappointed that uh, Carson didn't get a shot at quarterback. I mean, they were – you know, when they put Laporta in there, you know, that was fine. I mean, you know, whatever they want to do. I thought they well, would run more of a wildcat type formation with that, and they didn't really. I mean, they had him driving right up the middle or whatever, and I was surprised by that. It, it, that uh, was but I, I was really disappointed that Carson to get any playing time, I guess. <laughs> thought he deserved some. I thought that was not a real serious play call with Laporta, quite frankly, Don. I, I don't know. If I, well, the announcers even made it. They even asked the question out loud, do you think Kentucky has a right to be offended by Iowa playing yeah. Laporta as a Wildcat quarterback. They asked that question. And I, I said earlier in the week, uh, Cooper DeGene was the emergency quarterback today. So had both guys went down, uh, Cooper was going to be the third guy in. But the fact that you'd rather run Sam Laporta in that situation, I think it was, a I, like I said, I don't think it was a serious play call, frankly. But if, if we're going to be serious, then and, and why not be serious, right? Uh Right. Maybe try something like Cooper the Gene at quarterback. I mean, it, you know, he like I say, he, he I can tell you on a good authority he was the emergency quarterback. So why not run him in that situation? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, there were other things that uh, Brian could have done with Joe too that that we can discuss. But uh, good points, right. Brian. Well, I don't I don't know. I mean, I I just didn't know enough about. I mean, there was so much messing around with the roster prior to this game and who was available and who was eligible and who wasn't, and I really didn't think they were going to have as much continuity really as, as a squad on offense today as they did. Actually, they surprised me. Um, I thought they overperformed, you know, coming out of the gate. I thought they were ready to go. I was really optimistic that maybe Brian had really come up with some, some, a really good game plan and um, was hopeful that, you know, they would be able to carry that out. I was disappointed that they didn't again, you know, do the deep threat very often. They did it a couple times. He, uh, you know, he overthrew it one time. The other ball was just didn't have a chance. Um, but I thought, you know, I thought uh, Labus played pretty well, and there were there were some battered balls that were like, you know, real rookie mistakes. But other than that, I mean, I thought he played pretty well for his first time out. So anyway, that that was all I had done. I want to thank you guys for doing a great job this year. It's been more entertaining, I think, listening to you guys than it's been watching the team. Uh, you know, I kind of get more entertainment out of this than I do the game. Um, but but at any rate, it's been very enjoyable. I wish you both a happy new year. And, Don, I was thinking about you when I watched the Army-Navy game. So there you go. You guys have a good one. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. All right, folks, we are – uh, about an hour in, and uh, we got about an hour to go here. We're going to be here for, until uh, about uh, four thirty p.m. Central Time, talking Iowa, Kentucky, and uh, I'm fine with addressing the future. And anybody who says enjoy the win, well, the last game of the season, Don, and uh, I mean this is all these are all valid subjects. So uh, to our phone yeah. line, uh, to our phone caller, we're going to put you on hold. We will be right back with everybody. We're going to take a quick break. And yes, we're going to talk about this stat too. 0 for 13 on third and fourth down. I still can't believe that number. But again, the Hawkeyes get the shutout victory today over the Kentucky Wildcats. We'll be back after a quick message from our sponsor. You're watching Iowa Post Game with Coach Don Patterson. Welcome to Iowa Floor Covering, a locally owned flooring store in Bondurant, Iowa that specializes in do it yourself 
projects. If you're a contractor or a DIYer, Iowa Floor Covering has your back. Right now at Iowa Floor Covering, get tough core click together 4.5 millimeter waterproof vinyl flooring for $269 per foot when you install it yourself. That's a much better value than you'll find at any of the big box stores. Looking for other types of flooring? They can help with that too. Between their exceptional product knowledge and commitment to customer service, the guys at Iowa Floor Covering will provide everything you need to complete your DIY flooring project. So what are you waiting for? Skip the box stores now and visit iowafloorcovering.com slash DIY. That's iowafloorcovering.com slash DIY. Promotional pricing only available with self-installation. Alrighty, we are back here. Iowa host game with Coach Don Patterson. Again, the Hawkeyes defeating the Kentucky Wildcats on this Saturday, 21-0, to one day before the calendar flips to 2023 officially. And, of course, uh, the playoff game is just getting underway, so we're, we're going to be here for about another hour, and then we're going to let everybody loose. And I know, Don, you want to watch Iowa, or excuse me, Michigan TCU, and, of course, Ohio State, Georgia, which should be entertaining games. Chance for the Big Ten to finally win a national title. Uh, they got two in the playoff this year, so we'll, we'll uh, look forward to that here later this afternoon. All right, let's try Ryan again. Ryan, are you with us? Can you hear me, guys? I can hear you loud and clear, sir. Okay, thank you very much for getting me back on. First of all, I have some positive uh, comments about the game and some questions, but first of all, I just want to wish you both a happy new year. Um, Coach Patterson, thank you so much for sticking with us all year. I hope you're back next year. You, You teach us football. Your insight is just second to none. So I just want to especially thank you as well. Um, question, because I do have a New Year's wish. Um, in your years of offensive coordinator at Iowa, have you ever had 206 yards offense and 0 for, I believe, 9 for third down? And 26 or 7 percent on the year for third down conversion. I can't hear you, coach. Okay, Corey, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yep, okay. Uh, I, I think I know what your question was. Have you ever had a game with 206 yards offense? Is that right? Is that one Correct. of the questions, or somewhere in there? Yeah. I can't, I can't remember that. Maybe there was, but I certainly can't remember it. Uh, I don't doubt that somebody gave us bad numbers here and there, but I think it's safe to say that our numbers in general were a lot better than what we see nowadays. That's true. So I agree because I watched every single game where you were the off. Heck, I watched every game before you were offensive coordinator. So my New Year's wish 72 or not, you're a very, very sharp individual. You know your football. I think the University of Iowa needs to back up a Brinks truck to your driveway and bring you on board. I think we would all be much, much happier with that result. RMD or not, you're you're still an excellent, excellent offensive coach, and I would love to see that happen. <laughs> Although I think you're probably happy in retirement. I'm happy in retirement. One reason I'm happy, though, is I have a chance to do this show because it's a way for me to stay connected with football. Yeah, dang it. Anyway, just (laughs) thought I might twist your arm. Well, just as Ryan, if he became the OC next year and Brian gets canned and and Don's the OC, does that mean we have Brian on the show? (laughs) But listen. For the record, I think Brian would be really good on a show like this, Don. I really do. In in all seriousness, I think he he knows football. I mean, I've never doubted his acumen as it relates to knowing the under, the game. There's a difference being being a successful coach. There's a lot involved in being a college football coach, as you well know. I think Brian would be good in this setting. Anyways, Ryan, maybe no maybe you would get maybe you'd get Chuck Long or you know one of those guys. Chuck would be uh, good. Too. So anyway, let's talk about the good. Um, I remember after like game three or four, I said, I'm worried about Cooper DeGene leaving after next year. I know I was told to pump the brakes, understandably. And yet uh, I'm more worried about Cooper being gone after next year. That guy is a star. He is 
with all due respect to Jack Campbell, who's got the awards and as far as I'm concerned, our linebacker discussion is Jack Campbell and Larry Station, period. Like they're the elite to the benchmarks with no disrespect to the long line of great linebackers we've had. Um, you know, in the Nebraska game, if Cooper doesn't go down in, what, two, three minutes into the game, they don't get the three touchdowns that were against T.J. Hall and Jamison Heinz. Uh, right. Cooper is, I believe, the MVP of this team. Um, he's just absolutely beyond phenomenal. And, yes, I do think – we better have some people ready to go after next year because he won't be here much longer. Um, and then the other thought I had was run blocking. It was pretty bad today. I really hope Trevor Locke, I think his name is, is ready to go. Um, apparently there's an Alabama guy that isn't coming now and no word out of the portal of anybody that we've heard. Um, so uh, I mean, they're they're in on guys. Uh, I wouldn't be. I'd be surprised if they don't bring in a, a guy from the portal. They're in on guys right now. I, I don't know any specifically, but I know, you know, they're looking. There's no question they're looking. I know Barnes is Tyler Barnes has followed some different linemen on Twitter and the portal. I mean, he's not doing that just to mess with fans. I mean, I think they're they're probably going to take one or two. Ryan would be my guess. There's a lot of good linemen out there, guys with experience. In, if you're an offensive lineman this has to be a very attractive opportunity Um, because I mean, Caleb is really good. One thought I had though, and I know you guys kind of touched upon it, but I thought it was kind of stupid, frankly, number one, that a guy coming off meniscus surgery is playing the wildcat when Cooper DeGene would have been a perfect opportunity to, to it's, play that's that a good, role. It's a, it's a fair point. <laughs> I, I, I mean, here here's a guy who's going to be probably a third-round pick, if you believe the mock drafts in the NFL draft, and coming off meniscus surgery, and you're playing him at quarterback, running him twice. I just – I did not understand that for the life of me. I know we heard rumors and – Apparently, it wasn't even a rumor. It was a fact that he was practicing some of those plays in in practice. And it made no was... sense at all to me. You're talking about Sam? You're talking Laporta. About Sam? Laporta. I, I, was told, I, I was told by a reliable source that that was simply to mess with the media. Now, they ran him. They, they did give him a play today. and, and Three. But again, it wasn't a – did they give him – no. They didn't give well, him yes, they did. They, he ran a twice for six snaps. yards. Yeah. Not when the game one, was – One was a handoff to uh, Caleb Johnson, and he ran one for six and then ran another for no no gain. Okay, but not when the game was in doubt. All right. Correct. Correct. So, I'm just saying those weren't serious play calls, and uh, I think it's, it sounds like the, the – I, I was told that YA Black – took a couple quarterback snaps in practice as well. It wasn't a serious, <laughs> a serious thing. In fact, if you go back, Don, I know you watch it. You watch Phil Parker and Brian Ferentz talk yesterday. Did you watch that whole press conference? I've seen part of it, but not all of it. Okay. Cause, cause okay. Brian was asked specifically about uh, Sam Laporta as a, a quarterback as an emergency quarterback, which again, reality is he was not the emergency quarterback in this game, but he had taken snaps in practice. You could tell Phil Parker would not be good at poker because as soon as the question was out there, he could, he was holding back laughter. Like go back and watch that interview yesterday. Uh, he, he had the biggest smile on his face when the question was asked. So I, yeah, I, I don't quite understand why you run it at all, but it was not when the game was in doubt and you're the meniscus thing. I mean, heck, uh, for Sam Laporta to break seven tackles on that one play, fresh off a of meniscus surgery, I, I would maybe, say that's impressive. Maybe he's fine, but I still think I'm just that grateful was a he wasn't move. injured. I'm grateful he wasn't injured when he was a Wildcat quarterback. And then we would have looked foolish. Yeah, it's a big risk to take, but uh, when he's going into the draft, like he's he's headed but, to the draft here. <laughs> so yeah, I guess my last comment is. You know, when you're 26% third down completions on the year and you're hearing things like, look, I like Kirk. I will always think fondly of him when he hangs it up. But at the end of the day, sometimes he says 
really asinine things like we're not broken. Well, when you're 130 out of 131 with these kind of conversion rates, and then you not only you say it's not broken, but then you're saying, hey, we're just messing with the media, you know, if that's if that's true. Well, when you're 130 out of 131, I would hope 100% of your practice reps are serious because they need to be, you know. Yeah. Well, I was told, just for the record, because I had the same response, and the person that I that I spoke with, who, again, is uh, was there and, and knows what happened, this individual told me that uh, it was very – there were very few snaps. It, it was just uh, – I mean, it was a few minutes. So – I get what you're saying because I had the same reaction. Are we really wasting time to try to fool the media? Uh, you know, the guys are going to have a, a. I think it was more of just to give the give the give guys like Laporta and Black ha, let them have a, a good time here for a few minutes and you know keep the media kind of guessing. I don't think it probably fooled everybody in the media either, for the record. But that's what I was told. It could be. I I guess it's possible it's inaccurate information, but it was a reliable source. Well, the last comment I have is, Coach, if you do find a Brinks truck for some reason in your driveway, please don't shoo him away. I will promise you, Ryan, I won't shoo him away. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Now I got some hope. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate the call, sir. Thank you very much, guys. Happy New Year. And, Coach, thanks again for all your time this year, and you've been wonderful. Thank you, Ryan, for your kind words. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, I want to take a moment here to remind everybody, if you're interested in becoming a premium subscriber, you can do so by clicking the join button next to from the Hawkeye of the Storm. If you're on an iPhone, you may have to log in on the desktop when the show's over. That's fine. Uh, click the join button and you're supporting the show. You'll get some perks, some early video releases. And of course, uh, you'll also be supporting the work being done here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. And speaking of becoming a premium subscriber, Coil Stipulate. Thank you, Coil Stipulate, for becoming our most recent premium member here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Again, follow Koi Stipulate's example here and uh, becoming a member to support this channel. Pugmaster, appreciate the super sticker from Pugmaster, regular uh, chatter, supporter, listener here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. And uh, one more thing before we move on to our next caller. Um, if you are not following the show on Instagram, please head over to Instagram and do that real quick. Click the follow button and... Uh, Follow us at from the Hawkeye at from the Hawkeye on Instagram. Same as our Twitter handle at from the Hawkeye. And of course our, our Facebook page needs some work too. Maybe that's a, an off season project that I can undertake, but uh, a lot of work has been put into the Instagram page. So please consider supporting the channel following it. We have some exclusive content on the Instagram uh, page. So consider following uh, from the Hawkeye of the storm on Instagram. And of course, share the show out on social media in general. That always helps when you do that. All right, let's get to our caller who's been on hold. Thank you for calling from the Hawkeye of the Storm, Iowa Post game with Coach John Patterson, who's on the line. Lomansky, Corey, a happy new year to you and Coach. Thank you, Lomansky. How you how you doing up in the great state of Wisconsin? Well, I uh, I rather be sitting in Iowa City, but you got to accept certain things in life. Uh, you know, the, the chat is so intelligent and 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 so sharp, but they fail to realize if you want to get to Dan Don Patterson. If you want to get to him and, and, and call a good defensive play against him, you gotta, you gotta email Corey to get to Mrs. Patterson. And then Mrs. Patterson, we know is, is coach to coach. So if we want a cowboy hat on him, or if we want him to be offensive coordinator, or if we just simply want him to come back next year, coach, we will get to Mrs. Patterson because we know where the, all the power lies. <laughs> I know Mrs. Patterson and, is there some truth in that comment, Don? <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good, pretty good rationale. <laughs> You're the only Texan who refuses to wear a cowboy hat, and I know that deep down that's not you. It's somebody in behind the scenes that knows your public style. What would be the best public style for you, Coach? <laughs> well, I was I was born in central, uh, north central Texas. And unless you're west of Fort Worth, you're really not you're really not much of a cow a cowboy type of guy. You know, if you if you're west of Fort Worth, you probably do have a good pair of cowboy boots, but otherwise probably not. I like both your opinions, like uh and maybe this is not the smartest question in the world, but we couldn't get our third string quarterback on the field. You know, if you 
didn't Hayden used to say this? And maybe Don, you said if you coach long enough, you'll see everything. We couldn't get our second string or third string quarterback on a football field. God bless America. We got both of them on the field, boys. Hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> well, I would have liked to have seen Carson May today, too. We had a chance to put him in late and didn't. Uh, but whatever. I guess I shouldn't expect him to get to play. If if Labus hadn't had a snap all year, I don't know what would make me think that Carson May would get one today. I agree. That, 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 honestly, and, and I know some people are going to say, well, you're always critical. You're never happy. That's fine. It, it makes sense to have played Carson a few snaps, Don, because if you're debuting, if you're if you're if you're auditioning these guys for potentially a role next year, whether that be as a starter or with Cade coming in as a backup, wouldn't you like to see Carson in a real game that doesn't really have huge implications when you're up 21 zero? I mean, again, well, yes, let me give you an example, Corey, that, that is a takeoff on what you just asked the question you just asked. Think back. Imagine you're a Kentucky fan today. I know this much. I felt sorry for Dustin Wade. I was hoping they were going to pull him sooner because he was clearly in over his head. Uh, I mean, how many mistakes can you afford to make? Throwing a little bit late to the flat is one thing. He threw so late to the flat that Cooper, Cooper from off coverage, had no problem getting in the throwing lane. It was easy for him to do it. That ball was unbelievably late. That looks like something a high school quarterback would do. At that point, I would have yanked him right then. We're already down 21 nothing. He's already proven he can't make good decisions. Get him I out. But here's the reality, and I don't believe he came in until about five minutes left. I think I made a note. Six minutes left. Deuce Hogan finally in the game, 5.53 on the clock. You know who looked pretty good throwing the ball if you're a Kentucky yeah, fan? Deuce Hogan yeah. did. He looked better than the other guy. I agree. I didn't think the play calling was great for Deuce there at the end, but you're right. Uh, and, and, I, and maybe we shouldn't read too much into depth charts because we know we've learned here this year with Kirk that you can't read too much in these depth charts, Don. But uh, the depth chart indicated that there were three guys that had a chance to play on on Saturday. Um, and you're right. I mean, how long of a leash does a guy like Destin Wade have? Has he built up some long leash? Uh, I mean, why not go to uh, one of the other two guys? Uh and this Early. is after Kentucky said, we're going to play all three quarterbacks. They yeah, said a little, that. A little strange there. Yeah. And, and Destin, for the record, uh, Don, Destin got to a point in this game. Uh, there was one play where he dropped back. And, and the pocket was I, – I, I thought the offensive line blocked decently well in the play. And within a second, he had decided, I'm taking off. And, and to me, that yeah. was an indication right there, Don, that it's in his head. You you may need to make it. Did you see? You saw what I'm what I'm talking about? Yeah, get him out for his own for his own good. Yeah, Lomansky. Don, uh, I watched you make uh, offensive calls for many years. I couldn't help but think of you when we ran Wildcat. How many options there could have been with different players? I myself would put Cooper DeGene, maybe one series, but more likely bringing him on critical situations, fourth and three, you know, you know, they don't know who's a quarterback in your opinion. And Corey, take a shot at it too. Give me two or three players. No, no disregards to Sam, but give me two or three players that you would put in a shotgun. Like Don, you said all year long, give people a package, give people experience. Everybody on that field today, Aaron Graves is a natural ahead of his time, but give me somebody a QB today that you would have, either one of you guys would have put it in it at the, I'll call it wildcat. Well, I mean, again, I've said it all year. I, I, Cooper is the obvious answer. I, I mean, if you're going to run, and, and for the, the people out there, Don, who say, well, you're not going to run one of your best players. Well, we ran Sam Laporta. <laughs> We ran Sam <laughs> so no, I, I don't believe that. I, I don't believe that's a line of reasoning. Uh, and and for people that say, why would Iowa run Wildcat? Don, they were running Wildcat two years ago. They ran Wildcat. Right. Uh, I don't think they ran it very well, partially because they weren't a threat to throw out of the Wildcat. But Cooper DeGene is a former quarterback. So um, 
you know, that would be my my one thing. I mean, I wasn't sitting here complaining about that during the game, Lomansky, but if you're going to run Wildcat and, and do something different and fun and exciting and and potentially explosive, do something like that. I, I, I Running Sam Laporta, there's very little – Don, is there threat, as great much as I like Sam Laporta, even his ability to make yards after contact, yards after catch, is he really a strong threat as a Wildcat QB? <laughs> I mean, come on. I wouldn't say so. Let's face it. Sam's good after the catch, but but after the catch, he's not sitting in the backfield either as he is as a Wildcat quarterback. You know, it requires a, a little bit of indoctrination as far as how to run between the tackles. Uh, Sam is so effective out in space because he's making the first guy miss and he's getting vertical with his, with his running uh, and breaking tackles along the way. That's what Sam's good at. Let's face it. Um, Cooper would be a lot more comfortable in – in a wildcat position because it's probably very similar to what he did in high school. Exactly. Anything else, Lemansky? I can't leave the show. My last, uh, my last this year in 2022 is to shout out to the great Iowa football programs. We got uh, dug in on national TV. I had a 14, nothing ahead of Michigan right now. And a shout out to Iowa Wesleyan college to the great late Mississippi state college coach and, I can't help but let Don or even Corey comment on uh, the late Mississippi State coach that uh, called plays at Iowa Wesleyan. And, and I sure, uh, I thought he was great for college football. I'll hang up and, and listen to the rest of the show. And guys, please come back to 2023, a big part of my social life. Thanks, Lomansky. We appreciate you being here. Um, all right. Let's, uh, Can I make one comment about, about Leach? Yep, let me just put our next caller on hold here. Okay. Caller on hold. Go ahead, Don, just your thoughts on Mike Leach. Well, one thing I think, the, the measure of greatness for a coach, some people would argue, simply ties into what kind of coaching tree he's developed through the years. And we're proud of Coach Fry's coaching tree. And, and of course, uh, um, um, Bear Bryant with Alabama, of course, had a great coaching tree. A lot of people would argue that Coach Fry's is just as good or better. Uh, but let's give Mike Leach credit. He also had a good coaching tree. He was able to hire some good young coaches. They learned from him. That made them more marketable. And uh, and that gave them a chance to have success as a head coach. Any number of guys have done that. So that's just one more um, effect that Mike Leach has had on the game of football. There are other coaches out there that are Mike Leach's disciples that are doing a good job of moving the football. And uh, for the record, uh, apparently TCU's up 14-0. Shane wants to know if Iowa – Offer Duggan, you have some insight on that situation, correct, Don? Yes, I do. Uh, Iowa did offer uh, Max Duggan, but I think Max Duggan understood at the time, you've offered me and and yet I'm not at the top of your list. I think that's how he felt. And, um, and uh, of course, I'm used to that in recruiting. Oftentimes you'll offer a guy, but he's not the guy you really want to commit. You offer him, but he's on hold, if you will because you're hoping to get someone else. I think Max Duggan sensed that at that time and decided that maybe I'm higher on TCU's list than I am on Iowa's list. So no hard feelings. I'll go to TCU. And um, incidentally, Max Duggan was a high school senior at the same time as Alex Padilla. So it sounds to me like we probably favored Alex over, over Max. I don't know that for a fact. I haven't talked to the coaches about it, but, but I do know that, uh, Max was offered by Iowa, and yet he didn't feel that he was really desperately wanted by Iowa. I think that's the perception that he had. All right, let's get to our next caller. Randy, welcome hey, to the show. how are you doing? Good. How are you, sir? Oh, uh, doing all right. It's good to get some payback. Absolutely. Good Same. win. 21-0. You, you really, uh, like we said at the outset, shutouts are hard to come by, and uh, boy, uh Give credit to Phil Parker. This is an incredible unit, and uh, good to see the young guys uh, inspire confidence for future generations here. Yeah, I noticed that when I was checking Twitter during during the first part of the game after X's interception and return for a touchdown that some people were saying, so why wasn't he playing earlier in the season? If you didn't notice, <laughs> Castro was playing pretty good, and Merriweather was – all first team All American, as was the, Schulte. Yeah, as what? Schulte played very well all year. Yeah, Schulte played good too. So, 
I mean, he's got to learn. He's got to ease himself into it, and it sounds like he had a really good bull prep. I would, I would never doubt anything this defensive coaching staff decides to do as far as personnel. It's on the other side of the ball. I, I kind of have a tendency to second guess things a little bit more, unless it's maybe tight end or something like that. But I mean, it's it's pretty rough on that side of the ball. What they choose, what they choose to run from an offensive play calling standpoint, having guys only get one reception. Ragaini, he had one reception today. Vines I believe left. two. Two, as I recall. Okay. I like, the one throw up that left sideline was a good throw by Joey Labus, by the way, Don. Maybe his best throw of the day. It was a good throw. It was an even better catch. Yeah. How many did Vines have? I know he had at least one. Yeah. Yeah, he had a couple carries as well. Uh, I actually have the, the box score, the official box score in front of me. Uh, Sam Laporta ended the day with five catches for 56 yards. Uh, ironically enough, 52 yards after uh, yards after the catch for Sam. Uh, so uh, that, again, tells you what he did on that long long of 27. Luke Lachey, three catches for 36 yards. Devine, uh, De- Deontay Vines, I almost said Devine. That's a good nickname for him. Uh, two catches for 23 yards and Ragaini. Hey, I said it right this time, Randy. Uh, two catches for 21 yards. So let's see. That's four catches for 44 yards to our wide receivers. So that that one, that first catch that Laporta had was he put on some good moves. Oh man! After the catch, it looked a little bit Kittle-esque. I was going to say it looked Hawkinson-esque, but you're right. Kittle's a great one too. Both those guys are great. Don, we do a good job. I'll give Brian Ferentz credit for this, and I think he deserves some credit for for that because he's been around. During the years of Hawkinson, Fant, Kittle, I don't know where he was coaching. What position was he coaching? Tight ends when Kittle was here. Do you remember Don back in who fifteen? Brian, what, what, 15, Brian, 16. I don't think so. Okay, well, our 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 offensive staff does a nice I job. I think Lavar Woods was. Well, let's not forget um, George didn't have great numbers when he played at Iowa, in part because of injuries. But you could also argue that he was underutilized. But our guys. One of my point is our tight ends know. They understand yards after contact. Yeah, and they, you know, I, I you just love watching Kittle in the league throwing guys off of him, and that's kind of what Laporta was doing there for a, a while today. I still remember this, and I've I've told this story. I saw the very first scrimmage that Sam had as an Iowa football player. It was during camp, and it was young guys versus young guys. And after the scrimmage, I only talked to one freshman. It was Sam Laporta, and I said, "Sam, I want to introduce myself. I used to coach tight ends here." And I just want to congratulate you. You're the only guy I'm going to talk to today in terms of congratulating them for how they scrimmaged. And I'll tell you why, because you think you're Mike Ditka. You're out there running over people. And uh, I don't even know for sure that he knew who Mike Ditka was, but that was the guy that came to mind for me. Uh, But Sam demonstrated even then. And I told him, I said, Sam, I coached a great tight end at Iowa that also were number 84. And he said, I know who it is, coach. It's Marv Cook. And I said, yes, you're right. Uh, but just so you know, if you keep your head on straight and you keep doing what you are capable of doing, you're going to play on Sunday also. And he said, Coach, that's my goal. And he's on the verge of getting that done now because he's certainly going to have a chance to do so. Yeah. All right. Thanks for all you guys do. Thank you, Randy. Have a happy new year. you would be a big part of the show as well. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, a couple things. So, I mean, I'm hearing – I'm obviously not on uh, – I'm not on Twitter as we're talking here. Uh, so I, I said a couple of weeks ago that I'd been told that Tory Taylor was coming back. I've seen multiple people in the chat say that he just announced that on Twitter. So that doesn't surprise me. I know one of our callers earlier expect, uh, expressed doubt on that because of how he played today. Let me see if I can pull up Tory Taylor's Twitter account here. Um, yeah, I don't see anything from Tory on Twitter, but, uh, uh, that's uh, multiple people have said that, that that's been announced, Don, which is again not surprising to me. But uh, your thoughts on Tory coming back next year? Good for him. He's a weapon, that's for sure. He's a weapon, and I'm glad he's on our side. Um, let's face it, you know, we honestly, if you had to assess who won the kicking game, my guess is out of 13 games played now, we would have won the kicking game at least 10 of those 13 
maybe as many as 11 or 12 of those 13 games. Um, I do recall we had an edge on field position in most of those games. The team that won on field position in our nine games, uh, nine conference games, won the game every time. The one thing we know for sure, we went on field position today by a landslide, and that had everything to do with the outcome of the game. Here's a, here's a sobering thought, Corey. Imagine for a second we don't have the two pick sixes on our side. If, if, assuming those plays never happened, what would have been the score going into the fourth quarter? Would it have been 7 nothing? <laughs> I suspect it might have been. <laughs> yes. But, but, but listen, that's the difference between a lot of these games this year, Don. The difference between scores like the South Dakota State game and scores like uh, this game. 21-0. I mean, there's a fine line when you have two pick sixes <laughs> for your defense on just terrible throws. You give the Iowa DBs credit for making the plays, but terrible throws. We've talked about that. Uh, real yeah. quickly, a um, couple other things. I can confirm this. Seth Anderson, Iowa wide receiver target Seth Anderson, has officially uh, closed his recruitment per his Twitter. And uh, uh, reportedly, his two his two reported offers out of the Power Five are Iowa and Georgia Tech. He visited Iowa not that long ago. He was the uh, he's two time Big South Freshman of the Week, Big South Offensive Player of the Year, Jerry Rice Freshman of the Year finalist, Second Team All Conference. Ended this past season in the FCS for Charleston Southern with forty two catches for six twenty eight, seven touchdowns. His dad was an NFL wide receiver. Uh, they've been in on him hard, got him up to campus when it was really cold. will be interesting to see. I was told he was potentially visiting Kansas here early January. I would assume, not not to speak for Seth Anderson, but I would assume this means that Seth Anderson is skipping his visit to Kansas, and I don't believe Kansas had offered. Uh, one more thing that uh, we should get to here, and again, this is just I'm trusting people in the chat here, but according to a couple people, Ray included, he says that uh, Jack Campbell announced that his grandfather passed away last night in an accident. Sad news. Prayers for Jack and his family. I, I did not hear that, but if that's the case, uh, yeah, I, I mean, just just shocking and, and tragic for, for Jack and his Campbell and certainly uh, Jack and his family. Certainly thoughts and prayers to him and his, his group. Uh, Don, just thoughts on assuming this is true. I mean, how, how, how hard is that to go out? And I'm sure you've had guys – Come back, LaShawn Williams. Remember, he lost his father earlier this season and came back and played. But the next day, for Jack Campbell to come back and play the next day, um, certainly wearing his heart on his shoulders, uh, so to speak. Yes, I don't know when Jack found out. Or do you think he found out yesterday that his grandfather had passed away? Not like it, it was says, last yeah. night. So. Last night. Late, late last uh, night. I'm, I'm sure Jack, Jack, Jack simply probably asked himself, what would my grandfather want me to do? Would he want me to play in this game? And I'm, I'm sure the answer must have been yes. Uh, and that's not hard for me to imagine. I think most players I've coached, if they lost the love, they would typically play in that next game, assuming it didn't conflict with, uh, with funeral services. They would play and simply dedicate that game to that lost loved one. And I'm sure Jack did that today. He certainly played his usual great game. Kyle in our private chat says that uh, Sam Laporta – uh, found this out after the game. Wow. This is what, am I, am I right on that, Kyle? Give me a nod if that's correct. He's he's saying that's accurate information. So uh, thoughts and prayers to Jack and his family. Um, bittersweet. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of things out there, Don, bigger than football, bigger than the game. And uh, absolutely. Condolences to Jack uh, and his family. Um DC Hawkeye, I appreciate the super chat, DC Hawkeye. As we have all said, the announcer stated to imagine how good Iowa would have been this year with even an okay offense. Coach Patterson, thank you for gracing us with your presence on this cast. You are awesome. And um, I would echo that, thank Don. You. Thank, thank you, DC you. Hawkeye. And I do recall you were aware of the Army Navy connection too, because we had a great experience at the Army Navy game. Absolutely. Thank you, DC Hawkeye. And Uncle Rico, Don and Corey, please use this donation to buy a plate of peach cobbler with a side of upside at Cracker Barrel, Don. What is upside? <laughs> exactly. I'm not sure <laughs> what that is. Oh, neither is Brian. Brian's not sure <laughs> either, Don. <laughs> so uh, let's go to this super chat from Uncle Rico. He says he started a GoFundMe page for Coach Patterson as Iowa's new OC. Here's the first oh. five bucks. 
Thank you, Uncle Rico. Um, all right. And let's see. Uh, I, I know I'm behind in a couple things. We've got Kyle on hold. We've got a caller on our uh, uh, phone line. We'll get to Kyle first, and we'll go to our phone line. Kyle, welcome to the show, sir. How you doing, guys? Doing all right. How are you, Kyle? Well, it was, uh, it was, I would say the second half was a snooze fest for any non Iowa fans, but, um, I thought it was an interesting, uh, chance to see some of the young guys as we talked about before the game. Um, first player that really stood out for me was, I know everybody's talking about him, but Xavier Wampa. Every Iowa DB that comes in and plays from the start seems like they're a machine of instincts and knowing where to be at the right time. Um, and he looks like another product of that plus five-star athleticism. What uh, did you see anything, Don, beyond the stuff that was just obvious today about what made you excited for him for next year? Well, I think it's safe to say all of our defensive backs are very well coached. And um, part of being well coached, of course, is having the mindset that you will be coachable. Obviously, Coach Parker has uh, – uh, so much credibility with them. They're going to, they're listening and hanging on every word. If, it, if, if they are something by coach Parker, they take it as gospel because they know it's, it's the voice of, it's the voice of experience, the voice of reason, do it as coach, coach Parker says to do it because that's the right way to get it done. And you see that time and again, uh, today was a great example. Uh, I think probably both of the DBs would say those are routine plays. Those are, plays we should make, but they still have to make them. And um, it was a thing of beauty, you know, and those guys understand. And, of course, you can think back to some of Cooper's interceptions this season where he did run through half the team to get to the end zone. Can't recall who that was against, Corey, but I remember it was an early season game, and he had any number of guys that might have tackled him except they couldn't get it done. Um, and today, uh, Xavier – proved all over again that he's very dangerous with the ball under his arm too. So it's fun to see. And that's what defensive players understand. They're not just assuming that they're going to be tackled. They're not going to run out of bounds with the ball. Are you kidding? There are a lot of those guys out there playing offense that can't tackle me. Uh, that's the joke about the lineman, of course, is they're not in position to tackle a skilled athlete like either one, either one of those two. So logically don't go out of bounds, stay on the field. Let's see if you can weave your way through the, the offense because those guys don't spend much time learning how to tackle. And we, it was uh, even, especially at Iowa too. Cause like we saw Terry, was it Terry Roberts in the Iowa state game that had the interception and then he got, he got tackled after yeah. about five, 10 yards and he, he slams the ball on the ground. Cause he knows like with, with the lineman on the field. That he can't actually lost his balance, didn't he? Yeah. He didn't get tackled. He just lost his balance and fell. Oh. Yeah. He and he, was, and he was beyond frustrated. Cause he's like, man, this is, this might be our best chance to score. Yeah, he thought looking back, I should have been able to stay on my feet. Yeah. What um so the the third downs and the fourth downs were really, really frustrating. What like as far as execution and play calling, how much of it do you think is play calling? And then how much of the third downs today were execution of the play that was called? Oh, it's a little bit of both, I guess. I haven't gone back and looked at each of those critical downs to see what might have been. Uh, here's an example that comes to mind for me. Third and five, a zone read by Labus. You might remember the play. A zone read for four, but he slid, and he was a yard short. And, uh, Corey, you've heard me say before, if it's a critical down, don't slide, unless you know for sure you've got your first down. Because the official is spotting you at when you gave yourself up, correct? That's right. Did you, That's think, right. That, did you think that was a good spot, Corey? I, I did because he, he started sliding prior to the first down. Yeah, for the reason you just stated, Corey, that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so don't slide unless you know for sure you've gotten the first down yardage. Don't run out of bounds unless you know for sure you've gotten the first down yardage. You've always heard me say that. Critical downs, you gotta you got to go get it. And if it's going to be close, then you have to be a running back. You have to get your pass down and fight for the first down yardage. So that's one that got away. That's one that could have been converted. There were others. Uh, some of those failures, I'd say, we're protecting the lead. We're running another safe play. <clears throat> uh, a couple come to mind. We threw the ball way short of the first down marker. That's a pet peeve. I know of yours, Corey, and you're right. A third and seven, a ball thrown one yard downfield, uh, and that pass was broken up. It was a drag route across the formation. 
I believe it was to Deontay, as I recall. Um, and he was, he was, um, he was hitting. As soon as the ball got there, he was hitting. The ball came out. I guess I can't. Re I'm almost certain it was Deontay. Um, that's one that got away. There were others, uh, but the bottom line, the reason we're not very good in critical downs in general, if it's short yardage, because we're not a dominant run blocking front, it's not easy for us to get the necessary yardage. And obviously, if it's long yardage, we're not that skilled at pass protection. We're not that skilled at separating from the defenders. Consequently, we struggle to get that necessary yardage on third and long. Uh, that combination of pass pro issues and, and then you got to find a way to get open too, of course, and then have an accurate throw. That's a given, but but sometimes that's not easy to do either based on the, the pressure that the, the pass rush has put on you. Incidentally, got to give a lot of credit to our pass rush. You know, they, they really didn't solve our – our pressure, you know, you saw a lot of what we call cross dogs. You know, the linebackers were running different bat, different pass into the backfield, and oftentimes that's when we got our sacks were those cross dogs. And typically, it seemed like Jack was the trailer, uh, but he he showed up in the backfield pretty late. A lot of people would argue those are covered sacks because obviously the quarterback had to hold the ball for a while for Jack to get home. And uh, credit to the guys downfield that are doing a good job of hanging with those receivers, the quarterback. He's an inexperienced quarterback. He didn't feel comfortable. Uh, he's just not very skilled yet at finding open receivers. And that's where you've heard me talk about pre-snap reads. That's why it's so important to get an idea before the snap or what the coverage is. And then you have a better idea of where the open receiver is going to be. Um, another thing, too, about that first drive, Corey, was I thought – I agreed with you that the play calling got like less aggressive after that first drive, but I think there's been a few times I, and I haven't watched tons of other teams, but sometimes I've watched other teams with struggling offenses and it feels like that first drive is something that they've like scripted and practiced the week before where they have like 10 plays that they're just going to go to because they practice them all week and that's just yep. predetermined. And then after that, like they're not good offenses, so they don't have a ton of other things to go perfect to. Perfect example, and, and I know this isn't we're not, this is we're slightly going off subject, but go back to the Big Ten championship game last year. I believe it was the first offensive drive. I believe it was the first offensive drive of the game, and they go halfback pass. That was scripted, and you think, "Wow, you know, we're breaking tendency." And and how about that for a start? Never, never went back to. Didn't have any other exotics planned. Uh, that's that's you talked about not having enough plays, Don. I know not, yeah. we're not just talking about exotics, but that's a perfect example. Um, I, I think if there was as much work put into the game plan as a whole as there, as there is to what Kyle just alluded to, maybe first drive offense, perhaps you have better results. Is that is that a thing or is, is it more so, you know, you, you have a, a first drive planned out, orchestrated to a T, and then you kind of let the flow of the game come to you? How would you balance that? I don't doubt that a lot of our first calls on that first possession were plays that we were planning on running on that first possession in the game. Let's face it, the first two snaps were both variations of naked, and the third snap was the misdirection Y screen. Uh, those are those are plays that we kept going back to that did give us pretty good success, except the more they saw them, the better they defended them, of course. Yeah, and they – did, I, I don't know if this counts right either, but six total touches for the wide receivers. Um, that was what the wide receivers had, what, four catches? And then were there two wide receiver run run plays? I believe there were seven targets for the wideouts, as I recall, because it was exactly half as many targets as the tight ends. Tight ends had 14 targets, caught eight. Receivers had eight targets. Uh, I'm sorry, seven targets, caught four. Isn't that correct, Corey? I'm looking here. Hold on a second. Uh, I, I don't mean to change the subject. I just got a release from the University of Iowa on Jack Campbell's uh, grandfather. So I, I uh, let me let, let me. Can, do you mind if I read this and come back to it, Don? Am I, sure, can I read this at least real quick, just so I can get to it, and then we can go back to the box score. Uh, grandfather of Iowa student athlete passes. The grandfather of Iowa football player Jack Campbell passed away late Friday evening following a vehicle pedestrian accident. William Smith Jr., age 76, of Waterloo, Iowa, was the victim of the incident, which involved one vehicle. Smith was transported to Vanderbilt Medical Center, where he was pronounced deceased. 
Our hearts are with Jack and his entire family as they grieve the tragic death of their grandfather and father. William Smith Jr. said, head coach Kirk Ferentz, we know Mr. Smith was a strong influence on his grandson and a faithful Hawkeye football supporter. All of us players, coaches, and staff members will keep the Campbell family in our thoughts and prayers during this profoundly difficult time. Jack's parents told him about his grandfather's passing after the Music Bowl game ended. His parents made the decision to wait to share this devastating news so that Jack would have one last time to play with his Iowa Hawkeye teammates. William Smith is the father of Jen Campbell, uh, Jack's stepmother. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, just unbelievably tragic. And uh, thoughts and prayers out to Jack and the Campbell family. Uh, yeah. you, you were asking me about uh, the stats in this game, Don. Uh, let me pull those up here. You're asking me tight end com- uh, receptions versus wide receiver receptions, correct? Yeah, I've got them right here, Corey. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, tight ends targeted 14 times, eight catches, seven apiece, incidentally, both. Sam and Luke had seven targets. Uh, the wideouts targeted seven times, four completions. So the percentage is the same, four for seven versus eight for 14. And the yardage is pretty much identical too. 44 yards for the wideouts on seven and 92 yards for the tight ends on 14. Uh, so the productivity is very similar, but you have to realize, of course, without all that yak yardage for the tight ends, uh, the efficiency would have been greater for the wide receivers, uh, a little over six yards per attempt. Uh, so not very many targets. That's still the disappointment I have is we're not we're not distributing the ball very evenly between tight ends, wide outs, and backs. The backs had three targets, two of which were caught, but only for a total of three yards. I mean, is it is it even – I mean – is it even possible at Iowa to have a functional offense that's top 100 in the country getting seven targets a game to wide receivers? Is that even possible? That's a problem. You're right, because those guys, and, and most of the course, those guys are the ones that are the beneficiaries of explosive plays. Yeah. If it's not done by a running back, then it's, it's more often done by a wide receiver than a running back even. Uh, so those are the guys that oftentimes do have single coverage, and um, if they can beat their man, obviously the results can be really, really um, significant. So we're not getting much mileage at all out of our, out of our wide receivers. It's not all their fault, of course. Uh, there's a there's a factor of pass protection in there that's got to be considered. There's also, of course, that matter of the quarterback being accurate with those throws. So those are the kind of reasons that they might not be productive as they'd like. How do you how do you see that going forward next year, Corey? Do you feel good about uh, Anderson and Tesla, and then the room, the wide receiver room next year as a whole? The the Seth Anderson one, I'm, I'm honestly 50 50 right now on that one because I think uh, I lost or, you, Corey. Uh, can you hear me, Don? Yeah, I would say Seth Anderson. I'm 50 50 on right now. Um, I think it's 50-50 Georgia Tech-Iowa. I've been told this way, and then I've been told that way, that he was really happy, really impressed with Iowa. And and then he, he went back home, landed, the, the plane landed uh, down in Charleston, and that's when Georgia Tech was on the phone and officially offered him a scholarship, full-ride scholarship. So I, I don't know on that one. Uh, certainly I would think I would be surprised if he commits anywhere else because he hasn't reported any other Power 5 offers. I know he was high in Appalachian State at one time. But, you know, logic would tell me that he's probably going to a power five if he has an opportunity. As it relates to Tesla, I mean, the kid just keeps piling in more offers. He's gotten offers from Ole Miss, Texas A&M, Colorado, Miami, Oklahoma State. Just go down the list. He visited Iowa State. That's the one advantage Iowa had. They got in on him early, got him on campus early. Uh, I was told he was visiting Baylor. I don't know if that's official or not. I, I feel a lot better about Anderson. They need both of them. I mean, if they get one of them, I'll be happy, but but not satisfied because they lost – two really good receivers. I don't care what anybody has to say about Bruce and, and Johnson. They lost two really good receivers. So they need both of them. And um, then you need to de- develop the guys you have. Great news to have R- Nico Ragaini back. Don, maybe that'd be a good opportunity. And then we'll let you slide, Kyle. Don, just comment on Ragaini um, announcing this week, telling the media that he was coming back, which wasn't a surprise, but it was good to hear. I'm really happy that Nico's back. I think he's going to be a great role model for the younger receivers. Uh, he is a savvy player. He does have a good idea of how to play that position. 
Uh, of course, he's got reliable hands. As evidenced again today, that was a wonderful uh, catch on that seam route. So uh, he's going to give us great leadership next year, no doubt about it, because he's um, he's a really solid player. The one thing he lacks, he's he's not as fast as some guys, of course, that you can find. Uh, but the fact that he's a good route runner and got super hands, uh, I think that still makes him very, very valuable to our offense. Anything else, Kyle? That's good for me. Uh, appreciate everything you guys do, and uh, especially Don, second level uh, analytics and analysis and stuff makes watching the games uh, a lot more interesting when you have a lot of stuff to look for. And just uh, appreciate everything you guys do. Thanks, you. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate your help. Thanks, well. Kyle. Um, I want to. I want to give a shout out to a few people here. Terry A. Uh, and this is these are this is going back a few weeks. Terry A. Thank you for the donation. Um, Pat O, thank you for the donation. Late November, we haven't had many live shows lately, football wise. So, wanted to make sure these people got their proper shout outs. And if I missed you, I apologize. Please let me know and I'll give you a proper shout out. Uh, Tony S, thank you for the donation recently. Michael W, just donated here a few minutes ago. Chad W, Jeremy P, David M. And I'm not giving your last name just for privacy, privacy perspective. Those people uh, utilized our uh, donate links, which are Venmo, Cash App, PayPal. You can donate by credit card. By means of the PayPal uh, link. So consider doing that, please. It does support the channel uh, and the work being done here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Um, I, I want to go through kind of quick fire in the chat, Dom. we got about 10 minutes left before we hit our two-hour mark, which is what our goal was. So let's go kind of yeah. fire here, um, and then we'll get to our, our caller who's been on hold patiently. We appreciate that. I just don't want to fall further behind in the chat. Italicus, does Cooper enter the draft next year? Good question, uh, Don. I mean, that's Obviously, depending on how his his season goes next year, what's his what are his nil uh, what's his nil potential here? I mean, that's got to be weighed now with these decisions from athletes. But uh, I would say it's possible he could enter the draft in twenty twenty four. If he were my son, based on what I'd seen so far, I would encourage him to stay in school and and come back for a fourth year. Correct me if I'm wrong. He's only in his second year right now, Correct. so you're talking about him leaving after three years. Correct. I think that'd be a mistake in part just because it's kind of hard to graduate in three years. Uh, get your degree, stick around for two more years, and um, and odds are, of course, he'll be done with his four years of eligibility. I guess I don't know that. Did did last year count as a year of elig uh, a year lost to eligibility? Did he only play in four games? Maybe is he a redshirt freshman right now, or a true sophomore? I don't know. I'm not sure either. Uh I'll, I'll look it up here, Don. Uh, let's get to our next question. I'll come back to this. Weston wants to know, is anybody else concerned that Labus is going to transfer? Well, sure. I said that going into the game. This is an opportunity to not only potentially put some film on tape for other schools, but to potentially audition for the, the backup job. I don't know that he did enough on tape, Don, to attract major offers from other schools today. So my guess is he's yeah. back, but it wouldn't be shocked to see him enter the portal. Well, I'm trying to figure out the comment here by Weston. I could see if they try to place him as number three quarterback. The obvious question is, who's number two then? We didn't think enough of of um, Carson of Carson to put him out there today. So if uh, if Labus is not number two, then who is? Are we talking uh, about a, another transfer? Yeah, there have yeah, been, been rumblings that Carson's been really good, but it's just behind on his head knowledge. So. I guess you could argue, you know, in the spring we get past spring, but then Joe, you know, you're, you're kind of missing that opportunity to get in the portal for Joe. I would be, I would, I would guess what happens is Joe comes back. And then if, if there's no headway and Carson jumps him heading into next season, he's gone after next year would be my guess. Probably it's hard for anybody to have three proven quarterbacks. Yes. Let's face it. It's difficult to have two even because a guy that's second team at one place is looking at all these options that would give him a chance to be first team somewhere else. Jason says, is it just me or does Wampa look like long neck himself, Merton Hanks? Uh, I think it's just you, Jason. Uh, I recruited Merton. Merton's neck is longer than than uh, than Xavier's, I do believe. Ryan wants to know, how many plays do we actually run today, Don? Can, can you have that stat? Uh, 24 runs and 24 passes. Is that true? 48 plays? Uh, let me. <laughs> well, no. it wouldn't shock me. Would that shock you, Don? No, it wouldn't. 
Total plays, 48. 48 plays. Wow. You heard me say one reason we only had 206 yards is because their offense had a chance to be out there to throw a pick six and then go back on the field again. So in that regard, we got cheated out of a couple of possessions, hence the 48 snaps. Let's get to our caller who's been on hold. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach John Patterson. Who's on the line? My name's Lance. Hey, Lance, can I can I get you just to turn down your computer real quick? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Uh, um, I just wanted to say that um, love your show. Watch it all the time. Um, best show on YouTube. Thank you, sir. Um, my uh, my mom passed away. Uh, unfortunately, last bowl game when Iowa played Kentucky, um, and she uh, thought that Spencer had to go, and um, she was like uh, adamant the whole season. And uh, it's sad that I can't get a hold of her anymore because you know she was. We would talk periodically throughout the season. And she was like, Spencer this, Spencer that. And so now that we've got a um, changing of the guard, so to speak, we've got like uh, a Joey and we got the uh, the kid coming in from Michigan. Um, I guess uh, my question to you is, um, uh, is that going to help? I mean, it is, you know, it is bringing all these, new kids in and uh it's because you still got uh no offense i mean i love i love our coach i love brian uh his son you know i mean what he's done in the past now but what they've done and what they built up in the past but now it seems to be it seems to me that there needs to be a changing of the guard and uh, and um uh I, i just you know I just think that it needs to come pretty quick. I mean, like you got all these new pieces that are in place and it's like, uh, you know, when you got these, uh, it just, it just some needs to change as far as the, um, uh, what you call it, the coaching staff. So just wipe it all out. What do you think? I mean, like that's what, I don't. I, I just think that there needs to be, um, like I said, you know, a change in the guard. So, um, well, Lance, first of my all, take, I wanna, so. Lance, I want to first of all express my condolences from Coach Patterson and I lost to your your mother earlier this year. Uh, uh, sincere, sincerest condolences to you. And uh, as it relates to, it's changes, hard. It's hard for me. It was. I'm sorry. It was hard for me to watch this game. So anyway, thanks. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate it, Lance. And uh, I would say this: we just look like we just lost Don Patterson. Um, as it relates to change, Lance, I've been very clear on where I stand. As it relates to change, um, I, I do believe that uh, there needs to be a change at OC. I, uh, you know, I, I'm not an advocate for firing Kirk uh, by any means. Right. Um, but but if Kirk's not willing to make the right decision, then someone needs to. And as we've talked about, if you listen to Coach Patterson and I earlier in the show, it's Gary Barta is supposed to be head of the department and, and supposed to be the ultimate decision maker on Brian because Brian is Kirk's son. So yeah, I, I believe that Cade will make a difference. Cade McNamara will make a difference. He's a more accurate passer. He's got better mobility than Spencer Petrus, maybe not quite as good as uh, Joe Labus, but we didn't see a ton of that today from Joey. So I think Cade will make a difference. Uh, Eric all will help because you're losing an excellent tight end, your best weapon in Sam Laporta. Um, the run game needs to be better though. If the offensive line isn't better, play calling's not better. Um, and you're yeah. right. Can I, can I just, I didn't mean to cut you off, sure. but the, uh, the O-line. So, so um, I remember back in the day with Brad Banks. So um, mobility seemed to be like, was, you know, was the, um, it was all about mobility and granted like Joey, um, you know, he seemed to have some wheels underneath him, but Brad Banks was pretty mobile um, is that the fu- future for Iowa? I mean, do they need to get somebody that's like a Brad Banks? Do they need to have somebody that when the line, you know, uh, implodes, do they need to have somebody that's 
you know, going to like be like a Mike Vick, you know, and just run outside the pocket and make it happen. I mean, like that's what they need something like that. I mean, is that, you know, I don't think having a mobile quarterback would hurt. You look across the country, not only in college, but in the pros, most guys are mobile now, even the guys that were bigger bodies. I mean, I think of Josh Allen at, at Buffalo, that guy is, the epitome of being Lamar big. Jackson or Patrick Mahomes. I mean, something yeah, like that, you know, exactly. So. But, but I do think I will say this, Marco Linez is a different kind of cat and he's coming in this next year. He will not be enrolling early, but he will be in the, here in the summer. He'll be able to learn behind Cade McNamara. He's got the potential to be as close to a Brad Banks as they've had since Brad Banks. So I give Iowa credit okay. for being able to hold on to him. That gives me hope for the future. But in the end, these guys ultimately, especially at the quarterback position, ultimately need coached by somebody who understands the position and understands the pass offense. And I question Brian's ability to do that. So I'm really high on personnel, but my big question revolves so, around coaching. So, so in your opinion, so if if they decide to have a change of guard, who would you um, recommend um, in place of? Brian Ferentz or you know if he if you were to if, let's say if Brian Ferentz was to go who would you recommend uh for somebody in his place I'm just That's curious a good question I, I had somebody ask that earlier here and a few minutes ago if I can find the question in the chat it's actually it's been more than a few minutes ago um I don't know <laughs> where fine. The, the, the question is but I, I don't know as far as specific candidates um I haven't even. I guess I haven't even gotten that far as it relates to evaluating that because you know, first things first, you you have to commit yourself to change. I mean, Paul Chris name right. has been brought up. I don't know that Paul Chris is the fans' choice, but I certainly think if you're going to run a pro style run first offense, I would say you know a guy who was uh, the head coach at Wisconsin and successful in his own right at Wisconsin would be pretty good if he's focusing exclusively on on the offense. Uh, he is a former quarterback himself. He would be number one on my list potentially. But again, if, if you want to change everything, overhaul everything, then we can have a different discussion. That's not going to happen under Kirk. So, uh, Don, you're back okay, on here. Yeah, I'm not, I know. I'm not, I'm not asking you to I- endorse any candidates for the OC job. But if Brian were to move on or whatever, are there any names out there that, that you have off the top of your head that should be in consideration? Well, here's a guy that I'm impressed with for how he can call a game. Uh, because he did it to us, and that would be Mark Whipple. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what his status is with Nebraska. If he's looking for a job, that's you're right. That's cool. That's awesome. That's certainly a guy to consider because I mean, you cut you off, Coach, but that's cool. So that's exactly what I was thinking. So. I give him a lot of credit. Uh, one one moment Cooper's injured, and the next moment he's attacking the next corner. So I give him a lot of credit. He, that was the difference in the game. Is is um, their 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 best wide receiver attacking our inexperienced corners? That was the difference in the game. Yep. yep. Really nice. cool. That's who I was thinking. I didn't say it, thought it, but but coach uh, thought it. So that's really cool. So that's exactly who I was thinking. Well, Way sir, to go. We, so cool. Lance, we appreciate you waiting on hold for so long, and again, condolences for you and your your recent loss. And uh, thank you for being a part of the show today. Thanks so much, you guys. You guys uh, are, are great. Go Hawks. Thank you, sir. Go Hawks. Absolutely. We lost you for a couple minutes there. Uh, yeah, I apologize. I think I must have hit a button on the computer here that messed me up. I hope uh, I didn't uh, miss, too, miss too much. Fast outdoor food. You, you think that Brian can learn to be a good QB's coach and no coordinator. Well, we're not here for a pro- – I don't believe uh, Iowa is the place to learn. I'll say that. That's how I would sum that oh. up. Um, I'm sure he could learn to do a lot of things. Uh, I could learn how to juggle, Don. But guess what? I, I'm not going to accept a job at the Deli Mart uh, down the road for, uh, you know, if I'm trying to improve my juggling skills. Uh, yeah. I know that's a bad example, but uh, there there is a process here. And, and when you skip steps, this is what happens, in my opinion. Um, R- Uncle Rico, thank you for the super chat, sir. Uh, Don, do you have a review booth in your house? The level of detail you give analyzing plays is like you were reviewing the play in the booth. Amazing. Just doing it on my Sony TV. I do have a, a nice theater that I use to watch games just from a, a fun standpoint. But if I'm going to study the game, I'll probably just do it on the TV because I can I can control the remote a little bit better and back the play up a little bit quicker than I can in the in the home theater. All right, Don, we promised our listeners two hours. We're going to have to go real fast on these final 
comments. So I'm going to Great. take the phone line, put the phone line down. Um, Coil stipulate says, think we might have a better, have had a better season with Labus starting the whole season. We could just guess. I mean, it's just total guesswork, Don. But obviously, the coaches don't feel that's the case. Yeah. Well, the smartest thing we did today, the difference in the game, one team uh, did not give their quarterback, their inexperienced quarterback, too much rope to hang himself. That would be Iowa. And the other team did. And, and sure enough, uh, the Kentucky quarterback made glaring mistakes, and that was the difference in the game. Uh, Jason wants to know, uh, why could we not figure out running straight up the middle wasn't working? They finally got to the outside, had some back-to-back -back good gains. Don't know what to tell you. We, we never really had it as a priority to establish our running game. I felt that way. Maybe we simply thought going in that we weren't going to be able to be able to get much accomplished to run. Um, you know, we didn't we didn't really make many attempts early in the game to run the ball inside, especially or outside for that matter. We came out throwing it a little more than running it. Um, and then when we got the lead, of course, our only our priority then was just not to mess it up. And um, we burned quite a bit of clock. We ran some ball control passes. We ended up with 24 runs, 24 passes. Um, so I guess in that regard, we had pretty good balance. But it's difficult to beat someone when you can't rush for 100 yards. And, and of course, if you only have 24 attempts, it's not going to be easy to reach that 100-yard level. Today, we didn't do it. Um, and um, I give Kentucky some credit for that because their defense is pretty darn good. They proved that today. If we would have... Needed to score more than seven? I, I, I don't know. It would have been an interesting game if if those two pick sixes hadn't happened. It might it might have been seven to nothing at the end of the game. Hawkeyes reborn. Uh, Corey, do you know a timetable of when a Brian announcement of any sort may come? Again, I, I have heard nothing from the, the people that I know that are in the know. They have not. They don't know anything. So uh, could it be, Don, if there were coaching changes, how long do you think it would take for us to hear of such? Could it be weeks? It wouldn't be. I would think it'd be this month, right? This coming month. Well, let's face it. Some of the guys that would be um, attractive hires are, are guys that still have bowl games to do over these next few days, or maybe their bowl game was a, a day or two ago. So a lot of those guys, of course, um, are not available right now to even seriously consider another job because either they just finished a game or they're about to play one. Uh, but in that regard, uh, the convention does follow. I don't think that's changed. Uh, the national championship is played on, on the 9th, as you know. So there'll be um, a lot of movement on or around the convention, but there probably won't be too much hiring done uh, short of the convention either because obviously that's a good place to efficiently interview a lot of people would be at the NCAA convention. Doc P wants to know status on uh, David Cobb and Britt. Both those guys are listed on the official uh, – I got a lisp. Uh, official uh, roster still. So uh, for people questioning uh, those guys, uh, hold on a second. Unless my eyes are deceiving me, I, I don't see Justin Britt on here. Let, let me confirm this before I give you faulty information. Um. I, no, no, Don. Uh, I don't see Justin Britt on the on the roster at all. But I, I, he's not on the roster that was released in the game notes. So, uh, good question. Uh, he's not on there. But uh, by the way, David David Cobb is. So uh, again, don't know what that is. I don't I don't know that anybody's asked Kirk of that. And by the way, <laughs> I love the comments here. So uh, let me find the uh, the comment here. Um, uh, the top G, Andrew Tate. Corey should man up and ask this in a press conference. He's instead an enabler. Corey enables this. If you don't like it, ask in the press conference. You zoom into, Corey, for real, man. Well, I'll tell you this, Mr. Top G, Andrew Tate. Um, if there were more Zoom press conferences available, then I would do that. We've had one Zoom press conference with Kirk since the beginning of the season one and it was right after the the music city bowl was announced and don that's not the time to grill kirk ference and believe right. me other people have asked kirk some tough questions how about the ohio guy <laughs> ohio reporter that asked him some tough questions after the ohio state game so you know i know i understand you disagree with with 
where I stand on the situation, but give me an opportunity. I've invited Kirk on this show. I will do that again at season's end. And, and if he's, if he's uh, willing to come on the show, I'd be happy to have a conversation. Would love to have a conversation with uh, Coach Ferentz. Bob says, Corey, please comment about Brian Snarky response during the pregame press conference. Well, it's a good question. Uh, I want to, you know, we, we spent the last two hours talking about this game and, and we've spent some time talking about the future. I do want to play the snippet, Don, okay. from the press conference yesterday that bothered me. And it was a question from Des Moines Register uh, reporter Chad Lystico. Uh, I just want to play this, and I know some people were, some people on Twitter were complimenting, uh, praising Brian for how he responded, but the response did bother me just a little bit. Take a listen, and then we'll we'll talk about it. Brian, um, last time we talked, he was before Ohio State game. Um, there was a lot of outside night, outside noise after that game. Does any of that make it to you? And what's your reaction when you, you know, criticism? Right filters your way and how have you responded is that a serious question sure uh, did you read the ohio article I just... no okay we, i feel like we've covered this ground for all the Ohio guys in the room right my focus is on doing my job every day does criticism make it to me of course it does my wife has criticism for me on a daily basis all this stuff gets back to me in some form or fashion and none of it matters because my job is every day to wake up and try to put our players in position to be successful. That's it. And whatever my reaction to it has no bearing on my ability to do my job. So I keep my focus on that. And it's just like Phil said, you know, he's talking about playing defense. I don't think coaching is any different, right? Alignment keys, responsibility, do your job every day. And if the things don't help you do your job, then you can't spend a lot of time worrying about them. I understand uh, not wanting to be uh distracted from your job and you have a job to do. What bothers me is the snarky response to a fair question about criticism to say, is that a serious question? And maybe I've just lost patience with Brian. Maybe that's the case. I'll acknowledge that maybe it's my problem. Uh, but to, for, for the question out there from whoever that was that asked the question a couple minutes ago, uh, that's my problem with it. I, I just have a problem with the snarky response and, and the idea that, these questions aren't for like, like that's not a real question. Well, <laughs> we don't need to rehash the numbers. I mean, it's obviously a valid question. Every question that's been asked about Brian's performance has been valid, whether it's been from the Iowa media or from the guy from Ohio, the, the guy for cleveland.com, they've been valid questions. So I, I, I guess my patience has run out with Brian and uh, I've no doubt that he's a good person. That's got nothing to do. It's nothing personal but I'm just ready to move on. And that's where I stand on the situation. Um, Ryan wants to know, Don, did you do two a days for the, did Iowa do two a days for their bowl prep? No, I don't recall. Um, you know, you got to realize um, back in, back in, back in the day, it seemed to me like there was a finite number of bowl practices you could have. Maybe I'm wrong. I heard the other day that there's, they're unlimited. I don't know if that's true or not. But I don't recall two a days because you got to realize they're in school, you know they're in school, so they got to worry about getting to class and they got to worry about final exams. Two a days, uh, they don't even have two a days in August anymore. There are no two a days anymore. Right. Um, so back in the day, we had two a days, of course, in August. I, I remember vividly we would have twenty practices, if you can imagine, in eleven days. We would have two a day, two a day, two a day, two a day, and then thank God for Sunday, because that was a day of recovery. And then we'd have two a days the next week too, and uh, twenty practices in eleven days. You got to be smart about that. Obviously, you could you could do a lot of damage to those players if you if you weren't smart about how you approach those twenty practices. So some of those practices, of course, were scaled back, and we're not even in full gear. Uh, and nowadays, of course, they don't even have double sessions anymore. They have one practice a day. That's it, even in August. And that's probably a good rule because it gives the players a better chance to stay healthy. By the way, credit to Rob Howell for that video I just played a few minutes ago. And Brian says it's because why at that time? Why ask again? I don't believe Brian has uh, earned the right to dictate when the media asks him certain questions. I don't believe that's within his right to dictate to the media when it's valid to ask a question. And guess what? The media has very limited availability to Brian Ferentz. That's that's the reality. This may be the last time they get to speak with Brian until spring. 
Don. I'm not aware of any media availability before then. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on that, but that that's my issue with it. Uh, Uncle Rico says, uh, Don, I went to Cracker Barrel last night, asked the waitress to bring me the Coach Patterson special, but easy on the upside. Love and behold, five minutes later, they rolled out naked with Peach Cobbler. Uh, obviously, he's talking naked, naked boot anyways. Must have been uh, naked at one, too. There's naked to the right, I bet. It's like <laughs> left and go right. Unless they were left-handed. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jason says, uh, we can't expect the D will be as good as next year with everything we lose. I, I would agree with that. You're losing a couple of really good players. I mean, Jack Campbell being one, Riley Moss being another. They're potentially losing Seth Benson, Noah Shannon, etc. I will say this, Don. I got lots of confidence in Phil Parker and what we saw from the young guys today like Wampa, like DeGene. I really liked how Sebastian Castro played today at all levels. He had a really nice playing coverage. I uh, thought he made a couple nice plays in the backfield. He's, he's a good one. And they got some good guys coming in. I, I think they're going to be fine. Not saying they'll be to the level of the, the defense this year and be able to produce. But, boy, they produced a lot of turnovers last year. And we kind of say this every year, and Phil Parker finds a way to reload. Yeah, you're right. We're going to we're gonna always be solid on defense. Um, maybe our defense won't be quite as good as this year. On the other hand, our schedule is not quite as tough as this year either. So our crossover games do not include Michigan or Ohio State. We do have Penn State on the schedule, but – but uh, the fact that we don't play both Michigan and Ohio State is uh, a significant improvement, of course. Kyle wants to know, any thoughts on Brian Ferentz, uh, retaining Brian Ferentz instead of moving on prior to the bowl game? One advantage to moving on is clarity as the portal closes on the 18th to both retain and potentially get transfers. Yes, I, Kyle, I, I agree with you to an extent. And if you want to prolong this, then you're going to miss out on an opportunity. I can tell you on good authority um, that – Caden Proctor and people don't like me even bringing up Caden Proctor, Don, but I know I can tell you with good authority that Caden Proctor's camp was never given any indication that Brian was moving on. So even if he does move on, I'm going to ask the question, why, why did you not make the best offensive player to ever play in the state? Not why'd you not make him aware of this? And I'm not saying that that was any part of his decision to flip to, to uh, Alabama, but that is a fair question. And Don, I'm sure you're not an advocate for for firing guys before the bowl game, but with the early signing period being bumped up a lot earlier than it used to be, as well as the transfer portal window, and this is the first year it's been in place as it is currently, I, I think there is reason why some, uh, well, a number of schools not only got rid of guys uh, before their bowl games, but ac actually during the season, uh, there is a reasoning. There is a reason why those programs went forward with such. So I understand where you're coming from, Kyle. And Brian wants to know, uh, did anyone hear why Van Ness wasn't playing much? I don't know how many snaps Van Ness got today, Don, but he I'm didn't sure. make much of an impact that I saw on on film, which typically uh, he is. He's a guy who's an impact guy. Um, Douglas wants to know, uh, Mr. Patterson, how much of the bad line play is being, from being manhandled and how much is it from play calling? There are elements of both, no doubt about it. Uh, manhandled is probably not a fair choice of words. I don't know that we got manhandled, but obviously there's there's an effort to sustain a block, and if you if you can sustain it for a, an additional half second, that makes a difference on a play. Uh, so we can do a better job of sustaining our blocks, no doubt about that. But again, Kentucky's defensive line is above average, so the challenge was a little – a little tougher than, than what we normally have. Uh, next question here from Steve. Coach, do you think that the zone blocking is better than man-on-man -man blocking? It's a good question. I'm sorry, Corey. I lost you for a second. Do you think that zone blocking is better than man blocking? Uh, gap blocking, I guess you could say. Man-on-man -man blocking. Um uh, Gap schemes, I think a good a good running game has elements of both. And we have elements of both. I know you're familiar with inside and outside zone because that's really what we hang our hat on. Uh, but gap schemes still have, have a place. Uh, and man-on-man and -man blocking is another option too. Uh, you know, a simple isolation play, you know what I mean by an isolation play maybe. Basically, you block the man over you or you might call it a lead play, and you have a fullback that leads on a linebacker, uh, what we used to call it. We had a good name for that play. It was 43 and 47 pop-out. 
because the whole idea is to pop that linebacker out of the hole. As fullback versus linebacker, that's old school football, but it still has a place. Obviously, if you have a if you have an animal at fullback, that's a good way to approach it. Is just to uh, attack those linebackers and and have a back that can break off that contact. Uh, but you don't see much of that anymore. But it, it was part of football back in the day, and it could still be part of football. Um, to pick a scheme, I don't know. There are probably some some proponents of zone blocking that say if you if you zone block, just get really really good at that. And if you do, then you don't need much else. I don't know if I agree with that. I think I would still have gap schemes in my offense, regardless of how good a zone team I was. DC Hawk, I wants to know, is there a chance that Arlen Bruce the fourth comes back? I, I, I would seriously doubt that. He visited Mississippi State not that long ago. I saw he got into it with a, a Twitter account today. <laughs> Uh, somebody ripping him for not being able to return punts very well, and he went back and forth with him. I, I, I don't like the dynamic there, and I would be surprised, maybe shocked if he comes back. Uh, he, he didn't play in the bowl game. He, he's not on the roster, so that would be an indication that he's he's gone. Chris says, uh, what are the chances Barta fires Brian? I would say uh, slim and none and, and slim left down. I thought you might say that. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I would say it's very, very doubtful that that happens. I, I think the best case scenario, if you want Brian gone, is that they find a way to ease him out easily. Like, I mean, they're not going to fire it. Can you imagine Monday comes along, Don, and the release from the University of Iowa, uh, Gary Barta fires Brian Fair. That, that's not going to happen. I mean, come on, let's no. be real here. It's not going to happen, even if people want that to happen. Um, Shane says, since Iowa has such offensive problems, is Britt healthy and expected to return? Well, again, according to the game notes, he's on the roster right now. Mm-hmm. Will David Cobb play? I mentioned that. He's on the roster. Don't know his status. Shane does add, uh, as we are talking about DBs, I've always been interested in the career of Dallas Craddock, as have I. He was a four-star who never saw the field. We played today, so did he change his mind on the portal? Not that I'm aware of, Shane. Kirk was asked about Dallas. Um, he and Terry Roberts are the two guys that were on the roster and I had somebody try to tell me, well, it's because they they uh, those guys were graduates. Uh, Kirk allowed them to stay because they were graduates. Well, Alex Padilla is not on the roster, Don, and he graduated. So, uh, you know, right. I, I don't know the reason why Terry Roberts and Dallas Craddock were different. I'm assuming Terry Roberts was hurt. Dallas did play today, and it sounds like Dallas wants to be closer to home, finish off his career, go somewhere and play, and good for him for doing so. Steve wants to know, can we agree the Labus being a dual threat thing was slightly exaggerated? I mean, play calling is a big part of this, Don. I, I don't know that Iowa really utilized his legs as much as I expected them to, but uh, no, I mean, we didn't feature him that much. He's not Kyler Murray. He's not Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not Incidentally, t- talking about defensive line play, this surprised me, but I did notice him today. Logan Lee had a total of six tackles uh, and half a half a tackle for loss. Uh, so that's a pretty good line. Four solos, two assists. Uh, Deontay Craig had four tackles, three solo, one assist. You noticed him. Van Ness had a total of three tackles. Joe Evans, three. Uh, and then looking at the back end, uh, Xavier had eight total tackles, seven solos, one assist. Of course, he had the pick six. Jack Campbell had eight solos, a total of ten tackles. And, of course, had um, had a sack as well. So, Typical line for Jack. Seth Benson had seven tackles. That's kind of what you expect out of Seth. Uh, Sebastian Castro, five tackles and a couple of big plays that were related to uh, early in the game. I mentioned an open field tackle that was a big play. And then, of course, he defended the deep throw and defended that well, too. Um, the Kentucky receivers were frustrated that they couldn't separate from our guys. Our guys have a good idea of how to play, and we've talked about hand checking in the past. Corey, you know, you've got to know what you can get by with and what you can't. And our guys do a, a good job of knowing what they can get by with. And um, and sometimes that does frustrate a receiver. I know that happened today. Uh, Doug wants to know, uh, did Xavier lose his year of eligibility by playing in this game? No, he lost his uh, year of eligibility earlier in the season. They've been playing him on special teams a lot. So uh, he'll be a sophomore next year. And I don't think they expect him, if he pans out to be as good as he's cut out to be, Don Ying will be here five years anyways. So right. I mean, it probably doesn't matter anyways. Uh, same You've way, heard me same say way. before, red shirting's overrated. 
Same Those with really Cooper. good ones. Get them out there. Let them play. Same with Cooper, right? I mean, yes. when you talk about did he play last year? By the way, I'm looking at the Iowa website right now. They list him as a sophomore. Okay, so he did play enough to use up a year? It, it appears so. Uh, yes, he saw action in seven games last year. Ed one, uh, says that passing with two minutes left is embarrassing. I was surprised. I admit that. Uh, matter of fact, I wrote them down as they happened. With 140 left, my comment is, so now we throw deep. With 140 on the clock, we're up 21 nothing, And I'm thinking, are Kirk and Mark Stoops not getting along? What's going on here? It was overthrown. With 58 seconds left, another naked. This one was broken up. I think there was a guy in our face, as I recall. Um, pass broken up. And then with 50 seconds left, another pass thrown incomplete. So we threw three passes in the last 140 of the game. I do know that. Uh, all three were incomplete. Uh, but we were still trying to – I don't know what we were doing. We were maybe just trying to see if certain players could do certain things. Um, I wouldn't want to read too much into it. We – we weren't desperate to score. If we would have been, we'd have had a better chance to score, I guess. But it is a little bit odd that we were throwing passes and stopping the clock at the end of the game. Brian says that Kirk asked Alex Padilla if he would be interested in playing in the bowl game while still being in the portal. Alex said no. Uh, where I, I, I'd like to know the source on this first. I've had multiple people say this to me now. I've never heard Kirk say that. I've never heard Alex Padilla come out and say that. So if there's somebody reporting that, uh, that's fine. Um, but until I hear that from either one of them, um, no one's told is me that. Is that maybe a, a typo? Is that supposed to be Brian F. rather than Brian E., maybe? <laughs> Good one, Don. Uh, let's see. Um, Brand Miguel says, do you know why Iowa had the sideline warning at the end? I thought it was because there seemed to be a lot of late hits by Kentucky not called. Nothing I'm aware of. And then uh, Brian says, Tom Caker said it in a podcast. I don't listen to other podcasts, so uh, that's news to me. Uh, you'll trust, I'll, I'll trust that to be true on, on your part. I still don't understand if a guy opts out of a bowl game, Don, does that mean you just delete him from the roster? I, I mean, he, he's, he's by well, this time. I don't know. And that may be true. Maybe that's why Terry and, and Dallas were the only uh, guys listed on there because Alex was a, would have been listed on there had he opted to stay, but. Again, I, I, we're just trusting other people who are reporting this. Just like when I give you information on here, you're trusting me to be credible and the, my sources to be credible. So maybe that's the case, Don. I just hadn't heard that. Did you notice today that there was a Will Levis sighting on the bench? Oh, there was. Yeah. Just for a split second, they, they showed him. And I think they commented about him being on the bench, which I, which it seemed to me would be a little bit odd. Because, frankly, if you're going to opt out of the game, then I don't know if I want you on our bench. Uh, you know, uh, maybe every situation is different, but I, I don't know. You tell me, was was our our captain that opted out of the game, was he on our bench today? I, I don't know. Maybe he felt it would be he's awkward for him to be. He's not on the roster, so. Yeah, if he's on the bench, he's walking around without a bench pass, maybe. So yeah. you're right. I don't think he was even in Nashville. Uh, well, there, Brian E says the fact that you called him Brian F that hurts deep, Don. Uh, I apologize, Brian. <laughs> just, just for the record, Don. Um, so there was somebody on the sideline who, who was wearing the red hat, had black on, and was wearing the red hat. There was Carson May. Then there was another guy wearing a red hat. Who was that guy? Somebody asked me, was that Alex Padilla? I said, it's not Alex Padilla. He's not on the roster. Could that have been Spencer Petrus? I couldn't tell from my angle. It didn't look, look tall enough to be Petrus. I find it hard to believe that if, if Spencer would have been on the sideline, they would have found him during the game and they would have commented about him being there. So you didn't see the guy in the, the black? I never saw Spencer on the sideline at all. Uh, okay. If you're coming off shoulder surgery, you shouldn't be down there because you're at way, risk of being injured. It's halftime of the semifinal game between Michigan and TCU. By the way, TCU winning 21-6 to six right now. We're going to get to that well, in a second, so I promise we're, we're going to end this in two minutes. But I want to just – since we're talking about this, let me share the photo that somebody tagged me in on Twitter earlier, Don, regarding um, regarding who this person was, and maybe you can give us an indication. This is the red hat you're talking about. Yes, let me uh, let me find. I'm it assuming here. that's our fifth quarterback, whoever he might be. I'm saying now he's our third quarterback. 
well, who's our third who's the third quarterback don i don't know i mean we we talked about maybe um um tom hartley being one of them right for for the scout team i don't know maybe hartley uh, was where he went at i think i'd recognize him if i saw him though okay let me uh, let me share my uh let me share my screen here, Don, so you can see who who this person is. We'll go ahead and go over to Twitter. So you see there, let me go back here. I get this smaller. So you can see, let me hide Brian's count. Let me get rid of Joe's count, uh, stats. So you see here, the the you see number three, Carson May there with the red hat on, right? My guess is that's one of our student workers that is um... – that is an analyst or a grad assistant of some sort. You know, he's somebody within support staff that um, that maybe works as a signal guy all the time anyway. You know, we have people that do that. They're not always players that are suited up. Sometimes they're student assistants. Okay. Good, right. good, good answer to the question. Um, Corey and Don, with UCLA and USC coming into the Big Ten and Oklahoma, Texas going to the SEC, do you see both conferences eventually merging to form a super conference to obtain a massive media deal? I don't, Don. I don't know what that would look like. Uh, that's kind of an off question, but your thoughts on conference expansion as it stands right now? Well, I don't see them somehow playing a lot of games against each other. I don't see that happening because um, somebody has to lose. Spencer was there uh, in a sling, hugging Joe. Okay, good. Spencer was on the sideline. They simply chose not to show him, I guess. Well, Robert's saying that Spencer was in a red hat, but I, I don't know if that's true. That didn't look like Spencer from behind. It looked tall enough to be Spencer, but I, I, I could be wrong. Uh, and DC Hawkeye says he saw Spencer give Labus a hug. Uh, Robert, the same callers uh, every show and the rest of us can't get on the show. What's up with that? Corey, I don't know that you play favorites. I, I don't no, think I, you do. I, I, answer the, I answer the phone line as it comes in here. So, Robert, if you're still on, you just commented, didn't you, Robert? Yeah, you just commented, Robert. Call. I mean, the phone line is, I mean, you want to call, I and mean, we were going to shut this thing down. If you want to call, and we missed your call earlier, I've been answering the phone, the, the calls as they come in. The, the join link is in the description below, or you can call us at 515-635-1601. 515-635-1601. I don't I do not play favorites. If the same people are calling in, it's because they've made the effort to call in. And Steve wants to know I saw a podcast where uh he's talking about Josh Gaddis was earmarked for Iowa as the OC. Anything there? I, I don't believe so. I think that's purely speculation and rumors, Don. Um yeah. I would be shocked. I'd be shocked uh, if that was the case. And David says uh, he thinks it's a grad student in the red hat that's been on the sideline all season. All right, last chance for Robert to call in. Robert, we're, we're waiting for you. Um, all right. All right, to wrap this thing up, folks, and, and thank you again for being here. Uh, well, let's see. We've got somebody who's tried to call in. Are you there, Robert? Robert. Yes, I'm here. Hey, Robert. You've been trying to call in, and we got you here, sir. Uh, if you were trying to call in earlier, I guess it was just luck of the draw because uh, your call came straight through. Uh, I tried and tried and tried, but. That's okay. That's okay. Well, I'm glad Happy you're here. New Year's, Happy New Year to you both. Uh, I did want to say if uh, if Don doesn't want to be on the field, did he sign an extension contract for the next 10 years to do the show? <laughs> Don? Corey, is this a good time to say there are no contracts involved with the show here? <laughs> uh. Yes, there there are no contracts involved, but uh, our agents we are need to have one. We we're need still to have in negotiations, one. Robert. Yeah, we need to have, we need to write one up real quick. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, uh, I, you know everybody keeps on saying about the the plays and how, and I agree. Uh, you know, with the the, the running plays and all this type of stuff. Do you think maybe it was the prep preparation of the game with a quarterback that never played the game before? Maybe he didn't know very many plays. 
I'm sure that's true. I'm sure he, you know, but he's been here two years, Robert. So I, I don't know. That's true. If, if that's he doesn't true, know the plays, then who do you blame on that? I would blame his position coach. Brian. I, I wonder who that Brian. is. Practice three weeks. I'm getting ready for this game. Then three weeks of preparation. Well, in two years, he's again, he's been here. This is year number two, not year and a half. He's been right. here a year and a half. So, uh, yeah. I, I Two football seasons. Shouldn't be an excuse, but uh, I understand he's not running with the ones and twos throughout the season. You run a lot of scout, but uh, I think it, a lot of it comes down but, to play calling and, and coaching, Robert. I think, I think it's the play calling and the, the preparation for the game. Yep. You know, he just wasn't prepared. It to, to me, he didn't look like he was prepared for the game. That's what it looked like to me. I, I don't know, you know. Um, also, the other comment I had, do, do you agree with, which is, it doesn't make any difference, but do you agree with the uh, MVP of the game? Was Who that, was the MVP? Was it DeGene? Yes. I, I thought it should have been Sebastian Castro, frankly. I, I really thought I was really imp impressed with him. Um, Don, who would you have uh, labeled MVP? But Jack Campbell could have had a, a stake to that claim. But uh, I guess That's Cooper, the only, the only argument for Cooper, let's face it, when we're up by 14, the game's not over. Corey, you've always heard me talk about the magic number of 17. So the, the pick six that Cooper had um, was really the nail in the coffin. And he had – he killed several punts inside the 10. They yes, probably factored those in. And he returned a yeah. punt for 34 yards or whatnot. So when you add all those together, I think Cooper's a solid choice. You could you could argue in favor of the, a couple other guys too. But Cooper's certainly a, an okay choice when you factor in the kicking game, both as a cover guy and a return specialist. Well, even the, even, uh, the announcers said, which I agree, I think it should have been Jack Campbell. And even the, not, even the announcers were saying that Jack Campbell was going to be the MVP, and he turned out not to be. There was there were several directions you could have gone. Like I said, I was really impressed with Sebastian Castro all day, and he's not necessarily a guy you'd peg pregame to be the MVP, but uh, they had a lot of guys stand out on defense, that's for sure. And, Tori, hey, let's, no. we, we could also have thrown Tori Taylor. What a day for him. Um, we well, I would him say, him. what – yeah, that that would have been a great choice because what a day of funny, what a day! Absolutely, you know, uh, and for us to be lucky enough to keep him next year, we're blessed. Absolutely, Robert. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned. Well, Robert, we'll we'll wait and see what we well, got here happy, in the next few weeks. We'll know a lot about the program. Happy New Year to you both, and let's get that ten-year contract signed. Sounds good, sir. Thanks, Robert. God, we got Robert in here. Um, all right. Iowa defeating Kentucky 21-0 to on the shoulders of a strong defensive performance and excellent special teams play. Joey Labus, his first career start, did what he needed to do, right? He managed the game pretty well for a guy who was a backyard quarterback. 14-24, 139 yards and a touchdown. Just 67 rushing yards for Iowa. Actually got outrushed by the Wildcats, who were shut out. The Hawkeyes need a lot of improvement on offense. We know that. Third down and fourth down, man. 0 for 13 combined. Those numbers have to get better. They have to get better for Iowa to be elite uh, and to be competing for championships. And I'm not talking about conference championships. I'm talking about or, uh, division championships. I'm talking about conference championships. Please subscribe to the show, folks. If you've not uh, been here before, if you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the like button as well. That does help. And uh, donating to the channel helps. Venmo, Cash App, PayPal. You can donate by credit card by means of PayPal. Super Chat. There's a little button on here for that as well um you can follow us on twitter and instagram at from the hawkeye on twitter and instagram and of course from the hawkeye of the storm on facebook become a premium subscriber by clicking join next to from the hawkeye of the storm and of course shop amazon with us link in the description below when you purchase amazon products hawkeye merchandise whatever the case may be purchase them through our link and you're helping the channel thank you to the johnny o show for his help on developing that link as well as our merchandise and setting up our shop. The merch is here. It's available. What's the upside <laughs> merch from the Hawkeye of the Storm merch and more designs coming. We're not going anywhere, even though this is the end of the season. We're not going anywhere. So be sure to uh, cash in on the merch. Please share our show out on social media, even after the show is uh, cataloged, because uh, other people will watch it. Majority of our listeners, Don, I'd say 
the vast majority of our listeners listen to the show on demand. So we, we appreciate those individuals, but non-live viewers as well. And a lot of people have other engagements after the game. Some people probably pick the semifinal game. We appreciate the people who are here today. Um, and uh, we'll go to, uh, we'll make one more exception for someone who's been very loyal to the show over the last year. Let's add Erica. Hello. To Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy about our win today. I'm not going to get into the talk about Brian because I, a lot's already been said and I agree with all of it. Um, but basically, I wanted to ask Coach, um, you're always referring to certain variables or things that we win or that we need to win in order yes. to have a W at the end of the game. How did we do on those factors or on those variables? And I know you don't want to name them, but I'm just curious how we did. Oh, I don't mind naming them after the game. That's not such a problem. I just don't want to name them before the game. Uh, first touchdown of the game, we won that, and that was 88% win. First quarter scoring, it was a tie, so no one won that. Explosive plays, um, I don't know who won that. I think we did because I don't know that they ever had an explosive play. We, we maybe only had one. Mm -hmm. We only had one play that was 20 yards or more. Yeah, I don't that think any either of the teams had an explosive play. I mean, I was obviously paying more attention to Iowa than Kentucky, but – I didn't see anything explosive on Kentucky side either. Laporta, yeah. Laporta's play was considered explosive. Uh, yeah, I think that's the only one. The only one oh, to yeah, the game. Like, yeah, the first half where he was like kind of turning around and beating out the um, defense, right? That's the one you're referring to? That's where he ran over a lot of would-be tacklers. Yeah. Rushing attempts, you'll find this interesting. In Kentucky's nine games, the team that had more rushing attempts, their record was 8-0, 100% win. Today, Kentucky had more rushing attempts than we did. But let's face it, it's all because of the two pick sixes, the two defensive scores. So it's no wonder that they had more rushing attempts because we had to give up a couple of our possessions when we scored on defense. Mm -hmm. And then if you zeroed in on the five teams that beat Kentucky, they each won the following five parameters. First touchdown of the game, we did that. First quarter scoring, we failed. Total offense, we won that. Even though it was only 206, it was more than their 186 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Rushing yards, they outrushed us by one yard. Sacks, we won sacks too. So the majority of the parameters that mattered the most, we did win. But the big one, of course, is two defensive touchdowns. Right, right. Um, one other thing I wanted to get your perspective on is, and some, some people listening to this might not agree, but I'm wondering why or how it is that Petrus would be considered the better quarterback consider what we saw today. Um, we didn't see a ton of sacks. We didn't see any interceptions from Joe or from Joey. So, and I just, I don't see how, I think, I guess what I'm saying is that this is just another indictment on this coaching staff again, particularly the quarterback coach. I feel that Joey has a lot of potential and he did better on the field almost. And I don't know if that's possibly because Kentucky's defense maybe wasn't as good as expected or something like that. I have no, I don't know enough about Kentucky to make that call, but I just kind of wanted to get your perspectives on that. Well, to defend Spencer a little bit, we asked Spencer to do a lot more than what we asked Joey to do today. We didn't give Joey much to do today. And what he did, what he was asked to do, he did just fine. Uh, but we didn't ask him to make any difficult throws. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's one reason that we won today is – we didn't ask him to do too much. We didn't overload his, his plate with what we needed him to do. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but still, the Kentucky defense, I would they were big enough, certainly, to try to rush him and try to sack him more than they did. So, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Well, let's Maybe not forget, on offense, we, on offense, we scored a grand total of six points today. Uh, yeah. And then the, the PAT made seven. But, Don, but let me only just one. Add, the offense, the, the – the, Kentucky defense was down some players due to opt outs, Erica. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, Labus numbers are modest 14 to 24, a buck 39, one touchdown. Uh, there were games where Petrus didn't throw interceptions. I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong, Erica, but it's a small sample size. And of course, um, yeah, you, Don's right. Uh, they did put a lot more on Spencer's shoulders. Uh, the, the bottom line is, I, I don't think we have reason to worry about either guy because, frankly, I don't think either guy is starting next year. So, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're unless Cade goes down, you're probably not going to see Joe Labus start another game here, frankly, because I, I think if, if 
things go to plan, Cade ends up being the starter, and then Joe probably transfers after next season. I, I hope that's not the case. I'd love to keep him around, but that's the reality of college football nowadays. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, the other thing, too, that part of that presser that you played with, uh, you know, with Brian's answer to why didn't you do better, basically, was the question, I guess. Um, I, I saw a recording of the presser that was different where it showed both Phil Parker and Brian Ferentz as Brian was speaking. And I noticed that Phil looked a little bit uncomfortable, which I thought was interesting. And I get, I can get why I don't think I need to spell it out for anybody, but I just thought that was an interesting, uh, interesting thing to see. Yeah. No, yeah. there's a reason why Phil would be uncomfortable. Yep. I don't think we need to spell it out. Like I said, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for taking my call and thanks for another great season and happy new year to everybody listening and to both of you as well. Thank you, Eric. appreciate you being here all season. Have a good evening. Thanks, Eric. All right. Uh, thank you to everybody. Once again, uh, Harpo, he says, just understand you're adding to the community aspect on the show. You pe put people together with like-minded interests. We love having you here. I agree. Brian, uh, thank you for the compliment as well. And, and thank you for supporting both this show and our show with, with Coach Close. Same with Sam. Thank you, Sam, for being here. Uncle Rico, thank you for being here. Appreciate you supporting the merchandise. Um, Takun or Takun. Thank you for supporting everything. Brian, thank you. Steve, thank you. And everyone else, thank you. Don, I won't get emotional. Uh, it does make me a little bit sad to know that this is our last show, uh, post-game show of the season. But uh, to, to hold off the tears and hold back the emotion, we'll, we've got one more uh, show that you've agreed to do probably in a couple weeks, obviously, after the season's over, and maybe we'll get some news. Uh, I'm thinking maybe in a couple weeks. Don't have any date nail down with you yet but uh for fans stay tuned maybe mid-january does that sound good to you don sure and we may get some resounding answers from the transfer portal as well so uh don I, again I, I just we're not done but i want to thank you again for for being part of this show you you make this enjoyable for me I, I do consider this work but it's it's fun work so so thank you for being here and being part of the show as always i feel the same way Corey. thank you all right folks for Coach Don Patterson, I'm Corey Bratta. This show will be podcasted uh, via audio, uh, Spotify, Apple, Google, Anchor, all the uh, above. And uh, I will be back tomorrow with Coach Gary Close recapping Iowa-Penn State men's basketball uh, on Sunday at 4.30 p.m. Take care, everybody, and enjoy the college football semifinals. <laughs>